So hey Naim fans, the series name is What If Naruto Was Prince Underworld. So let's start the series. Sasuke called out a well-built young man with no sign of fat on his body. He had cerulean blue eyes and bright spiky blonde hair with red streaks. He had an angular face with three distinctive whisker marks on both sides. His clothes consisted of a black armor vest. Underneath the vest was a black short sleeve shirt, black cargo pants with a leaf symbol belt buckle, and combat boots. The young man turned around, showing the black markings covering the right side of his face. So it's you Naruto, Sasuke said with an impassive voice, looking at him curiously. What's with the wardrobe change, Dobe? He asked, remembering that Naruto used to wear an orange jumpsuit. Naruto Uzumaki is a genin of Kanahagakur no Sato, or village hidden in the leaves. He is also the Jinchkriki of the Kikbi no Yuko, or the nine-tailed fox demon, a beast powerful enough that with just one swipe of its tails, it can cause natural disasters, such as tsunamis or tornadoes. The fox was sealed in him when he was a newborn by the fourth Hokage, the leader of his village. On October 10th, as his dying wish, the fourth asked for Naruto to be viewed as a hero who saved the village by containing the Kikbi. But sadly, it was not meant to be, instead the people viewed Naruto as the demon, reborn into human skin, powerless and weak, so in their hatred they hunted Naruto down. In his childhood, Naruto experienced hell, he was hunted down like a wild animal by an angry mob, aiming to torture him before killing him. Throughout his childhood Naruto was beaten to a bloody pulp, stabbed, slashed with rusty objects, burned, and marked with a branding iron. One burn on his chest street demon and the other on his back that read Kikbi. He was even poisoned to a point where he built up immunity, and finally, he was drowned. All his wounds healed thanks to the nine-tailed fox, but the damage had already been done with his innocence, and childhood lost. It was only through those beatings that Naruto found out he was a Jinchkriki. The only question he could ask was, why him? Why did the fourth Hokage choose him to live this life of hell? Naruto even asked the third Hokage, someone who he used to view as a surrogate grandfather, but the only answer he would get is that he didn't know, so, imagine the shock and betrayal he felt when he had to find out from the people who were torturing and trying to kill him. The blonde wanted nothing more than to lash out and seek revenge, to make all those people suffer as they did him throughout his life. But the blonde realized that it wouldn't matter, he couldn't get back the childhood he lost, he was forced to mature, he couldn't get back all those lonely nights of him sleeping in the harsh land or the food he was forced to eat, such as rats, rotten food, and other things he had to salvage just so he could survive. It was all lost to him and he couldn't get it back, so instead, he embraced his hatred, his suffering, his anger, his darkness, and even his curse. He embraced all of it, and used it as a sort of motivation to make himself strong, instead of stooping to their level of ignorance and mindless revenge, along with protecting those who he considered his friends, people who cared for him when he was a child. The perfect example was Lilith, also known as Mother Superior. She, along with people she trusted, owned the major brothels, strip clubs and other business establishments in the red light, where Naruto lived the vast majority of his life. She has long brown hair, green pupil-less eyes, DD cup breasts, tan skin, a heart-shaped face, a perfect herbless figure, and she would usually be seen wearing her black kimono with a dark blue flowering design. Blue thigh high heels modified to store a hidden knife and holster several senmen. She was after all a former Anbu, which were considered the elite warriors of a hidden village. She, along with her girls, would always hide Naruto from mobs, and would always help him. This, at the least, made Naruto's life bearable. And it wasn't just her or her employees. Everyone in the red light saw Naruto as a hero, and not the demon reborn. Most were former shinobi. They could tell the difference between a storage scroll and a kunai. Unlike some of the villagers who saw Naruto as a demon and unwanted material. It was the 10th of October, when the blonde and them first met. Naruto was being chased by a murderous and angry mob. That's when Naruto bumped into her. She instantly recognized him from her sources, and felt a huge amount of anger at the mob, that for trying to kill him. So she hid him in her main brothel the Heavenly Leaf. Ever since then, Naruto would come and hide there, and Lilith and her girls would always hide him, considering all her girls saw him as their little brother or the older girls would see Naruto as a son. It was also worth mentioning that Lilith took great care of her girls, making sure they were safe and healthy, even in that kind of profession. Naruto respected them, regardless of their profession, and still saw them as equals. Looking past what society thinks of his sisters and motherly figures of the people of the red light, though he knew they could handle themselves as a majority of them were former shinobi and kinoichi. Naruto ignored the Ichiha's question and insult, instead he had his own question for the Ichiha. You're really going through with this aren't you? He asked, though it wasn't really a question. Naruto knew the depth Sasuke would go to in order to gain more power. You're really going to that traitorous snake bastard for power. Sasuke nodded. He needed this power to kill his brother, the person responsible for killing his entire clan and their parents. He was also pampered by the civilian council, the people responsible for most of Naruto hellish short deal. Also they could get favors and elevate themselves through the delusional and revenge-driven Ichiha. The blonde sighed. Idi doesn't know anything about what his brother did. Naruto knew the truth behind that fateful day. The Ichiha massacre. But Itachi Ichiha made him promise to keep it a secret. Then I have no other choice. By order of the Hokage, I hereby place you under arrest for treason, Naruto stated, shocking the dark-haired teen, before suddenly laughing. And who's going to bring me in? You. 
please, Dobe, you're dead last in the academy. How can you bring me, who was dubbed rookie of the year and top of our class, in? Ha, Dobe Sasuke said in a mocking voice. He felt insulted. He thought they would at least send someone stronger then. The duck ass haired teen was suddenly and abruptly broken from his thoughts when he felt a fist collide with his face and a hand grabbing the collar of his shirt. Before the Ichiha knew it, he was underwater. This all happened within a fraction of a second. The hell he thought in disbelief. Sasuke swam up to the surface and channeled his chakra to his hands to lift himself up from the water. He did the same thing to his feet, so he could stand on the surface of the water. What teen, you look dazed. The last loyal Ichiha helicopter see Naruto standing casually on top of the water. I didn't even see him move, no, it was only a lucky shot he thought. You could surrender and save me the trouble of having to drag your pampered ass back to Kanoha, Naruto offered, causing Sasuke's shake and sheer anger. How dare this this commoner trash underestimate him, a noble Ichiha, he'll make him pay with that thought in mind. Sasuke charged at the blonde with murderous intent, the blonde sighed tiredly and muttered, I tried reasoning, before easily sidestepping Sasuke's attack, and kicking the Ichiha up into the air. Naruto quickly leaped upward, not giving Sasuke time to react, the blonde kicked downward, sending the Ichiha hurtling straight to the cold water. The duck ass never even touched the surface, as Naruto kicked him again sending him to the right, and then he kicked him again, this time to the upper left. Hope you can swim after this, Naruto said, grabbing Sasuke from behind, and pile drive him straight into the water while rotating at a ferocious speed. He let go of Sasuke at the last possible second, before said teen dropped into the water. The blonde felt a bit of strain in his muscles and slightly dizzy, but other than that he was fine, ha, bet Lee would be jealous as hell if he found out I can do the Omnitrench front lotus, without a need to unlock the Hachiman 8 gates the blonde thought. So Suddenly, his opponent jumped out of the water, going through the necessary hand seals before shouting. Kaden. Nkakuk no jutsu fire release. Great fireball technique Sasuke fired a massive orb of roaring flame straight at his former teammate. The blonde remained calm and did a one-handed seal. Sujin. Sujin haki water release. Water formation wall, Naruto used the technique to create a wall of water to block and dissipate Sasuke's technique. Naruto didn't have an affinity for water techniques, but it didn't mean he couldn't use them. Using different affinities, other than your own, takes up a lot of chakra. Luckily for Naruto, he had nearly endless chakra reserves. The two jutsu collided, creating a blanket of steam. This didn't bother Naruto in the slightest, thanks to his ability to sense people's energy and emotions. The blonde didn't need to see where his opponent is. The same thing cannot be said about Sasuke, since he wasn't a sensory type like Naruto. He couldn't see where his opponent was. And, in a battle, that can be a death sentence. Thon. Rex Wind Release. Gale Palm. Rather than clapping his hands together, Naruto manipulate the hot steam to create a powerful gale. Shit. Sasuke cursed, knowing he had no chance of evading. He did his best to defend against the attack. The last loyal Ichiha screamed in pain, feeling his skin being burned by the hot air before he was then slammed into the ground. Give it up Sasuke. You stand no chance against me. Sasuke glared at Naruto with anger and hatred in his eyes. The Ichiha hated the fact that this no-name orphan was basically kicking his ass without so much as breaking a sweat. How can he be stronger than me? He's the Feening class clown. And the dead last Sasuke wondered. Naruto was the one who failed to graduate three times and was at the bottom of the class, so he shouldn't be dominating this battle, it should be himself. He was an Ichiha, top of his class, a prodigy, he was the heir to the most prestigious clan, he. You must be wondering how I'm dominating you in this fight. Due to his shock Sasuke, could only nod to Naruto's words. One word Sasuke, just one word, the dark haired teen heard him say. Deception. That single word rang in the mind of Sasuke Ichiha, and it confused him to no end, which Naruto saw. I see, even in your pain state, you are confused. Well let me enlighten you, Naruto said. Then, in a blink of an eye, the blonde was standing in front of Sasuke and crouching. He looked into Sasuke's onyx-colored eyes with his cerulean blue eyes. Deception is the bread and butter of a ninja, something that most, if not all, have forgotten. I, on the other hand, use this fact to deceive everyone into believing that I was weak. By becoming the class clown and the dead last, it worked. Not even the third Hokage, the so-called professor, figured out I was wearing a mask and hiding my true skills. So, you see Sasuke, I'm stronger than you, and most Jonin. Hell, if I remove certain restriction seals, then I could practically match that snake bastard. Now let's try this again shall we? Naruto stopped for a bit, and his gaze turned deadly cold. Would you kindly give up? Something inside Sasuke snapped. The thought of Naruto being stronger than him did it. Sasuke couldn't accept the mere thought of it. How could he? Sasuke was given everything he asked for to become strong from those in the civilian council. Dark purple chakra suddenly burst out of Sasuke's body, causing Naruto to jump back and away from the Ichiha. So he tapped into the power of the cursed seal. This should be interesting. The cursed seal, which was created by Rachimaru, the person Sasuke was planning to join to gain more power, was a seal that increased the user's chakra levels and physical capabilities while the seal is active. Once branded, the person had a 1 in 10 chance of survival. If they do survive they would become host bodies for Rachimaru to use when he needed a new one for his ambition of immortality. 
Orochimaru is able to do this due to the seal containing a part of him to inhabit the host's body, slowly preparing him or her for the transfer. Naruto could only shudder thinking of that gay pedophile inside of Sasuke, that is just wrong on so many levels. He grimaced at the mere thought of it, and, in all honesty, almost hurled. Naruto pushed those thoughts back into the deepest corner of his mind, and turned his attention back to the Ichiha, who was slowly standing up. From the looks of it, the black markings were spreading over his entire body. This must be the second level Anko told me about Naruto thought. Sasuke's skin turned dark gray, his hair grew and turned dark blue, his eyes also turned dark gray with a shuring inactive. Additionally, he grew webbed claw-shaped wings from his back, and a dark star-shaped mark appeared across the bridge of his nose. I'm going to kill you, Sasuke said with a dark demented voice, before he flew straight at Naruto with extraordinary speeds, thanks to the curse seal. The blonde simply sighed and met Sasuke halfway, matching the Ichiha's speed with his own. The two fought for supremacy. Sasuke would attack the blonde with ferocious strikes, using everything from his hands and legs to those wings of his. The blonde would dodge or block all his attacks, like he was predicting Sasuke's every movement, which he actually was. Naruto had the keen ability to predict and anticipate his opponent's movement, based on the muscle movement of the body down to the last millisecond. He could then choose to block, dodge, or counter the attack. So this is all the curse seal can do. Naruto taunted, dodging a roundhouse kick and blocking a second kick. He then grabbed Sasuke's leg and tossed him into the large statue depicting Hashirama Senju, founder of Konoha and the first Hokage. Naruto himself jumped on top of Madara Chuha, founder of the Chuha clan and Hashirama's greatest rival. The Valley of the End, ha, fitting place since your ambitions are about to come to an end, Naruto said in a calming tone before he saw Sasuke charging up his Shidori. The blonde expected to hear a distinct chirping noise that is normally associated with the 1000 bird technique. Instead, Naruto heard the sound of flapping wings and the color of the Chidori had a rather dark gleam instead of its normally bright blue hue. Naruto took a small breath of air and concentrated on calling out the nine-tailed fox's chakra. Suddenly Crimson Chakra began to dance around Naruto, and his features became more feral, as the energy began to surround him like a blanket. The blonde Jinchkriki held his right hand up, and a swirling ball of pure chakra began to form. Naruto concentrated the fox's chakra into the yellowish-blue ball, and, slowly, the color shifted to a more purple, orange, and red color. Let's end this though. Gladly team. Both shinobi fling themselves into the air at each other, with their attacks colliding. Habitaku Chidori flapping 1000 birds. Shuyer Sengen Vermilion spiraling sphere. The energies combined around the two former teammates, creating a large sphere of pure energy around them. Suddenly there was a flash of light, and a massive explosion of pure power, and Naruto could be seen standing tall while Sasuke was on the ground unconscious. You should have given up, this wouldn't have happened and you would still have your right heart. Naruto stumbled and felt a familiar sensation of cold steel burrowing into his flesh. The blonde turned around with anger in his eyes. Kakashi Haddock, Naruto spat with venom in his voice, removing the knife. Naruto suddenly fell to his knees and felt his insides burning. Hello demon, I can see you feeling the effects of the quick acting poison I laced that kunai with, Naruto's traitorous teacher said with glee. The blonde looked up with fading eyes as the poison was quickly spreading through his body, as he struggled to get back up. Damn it Naruto mentally cursed as he felt his pulse fading away, try as he might, he couldn't even defend himself as he stumbled to the ground. With hazy vision, Naruto could see Kakashi about to finish him off until something from the shadows suddenly sprang up. It was too fast for his traitorous teacher to react, as it cut Kakashi in half. The last thing he saw was a woman wearing a black hooded cloak. He could distinctively hear her say something, but couldn't make out what since his consciousness was slowly fading. Unknown Pav. I decided to visit the elemental nations and check up on my son. My mortal shell was destroyed when it was stabbed by a massive claw, courtesy of the Kaiubi. His power could be equal to that of Typhoon. I felt weak, and I had no choice but to recover my power back in my dimension. But in doing so, I left my son, Naruto. As a goddess, I can travel from dimension dimension to dimension, I chose the elemental nations, a warring world that had enough conflict to make Ares drool. As a role in going to different dimensions, I have to take up a mortal body and have my memory sealed. For a time, in those years, I never would have thought that I, well my mortal self, would fall in love with a woman named Kashina Yuzumaki. But the intriguing thing about Kashina was that she was a demigod, and to my surprise, the daughter of Hestia. Though I sensed that she wasn't born by natural means, I deduced that she was born similar to how Athena would bear children. But that was only after my mortal body was destroyed. Oh yes Kashina Yuzumaki, heiress of the Yuzumaki clan, a clan that was considered one of the best sword users and had mastery over seals. His bloodline gave them incredibly strong life force which can both endure and survive most grievous injuries plus incredible longevity. The clan members are also blessed with great recuperative powers, able to quickly recover from extreme exhaustion, and mend most injuries in short periods of time. They also value the bonds of friendship, and, more importantly, family. This could be why Hestia would have a child with one of them. Another thing I noted is that Kashina was also a legacy of Aphrodite, though I am not surprised by this, considering how beautiful Kashina was, from her long flowing blood-red silk-like hair 
violet eyes, milky white skin, and her luscious curves down to her firmy bust and firm rear. Truly if I didn't know any better I would say Kashina was a daughter of the goddess of love not the heart. But to be honest the Uzumakis were a clan of demigods. My mortal body was able to trace back each Uzumaki up to the first Uzumaki. Though I wasn't surprised by this fact. It made sense. Such as the swords they use. An Uzumaki sword was known to be the best in the entire elemental nation. The swords were light as a feather, able to cut through the toughest metal or cleave a person in half, and extremely durable. Truly Hephaestus would have been proud of such weapons. The Uzumaki clan was also known for their agricultural skills, known to be great farmers. Considering how small their island was, they were still able to grow an abundance of rice, vegetables, and fruits. The system of law was also advanced. Compared to the rest of the elemental nations, Demeter would be proud of them. They did well for their trading, though it was hard due to the fact that only an Uzumaki could navigate over the vast whirlpools that surrounded the village. After all, it is called Yuzushiagakur, the village hidden by whirling tides, and this is where Poseidon comes into the clan's relations. They were also known to be great hunters. Well there was a squad of just female hunters, and their Anbu was founded by a female. There was equality within their clan for both male and female. A perfect example was their Yuzukich who was female, and the first container for the Kayubi, Mido Yuzumaki. I have doubts that Artemis wouldn't have smiled at that. As far as ninjas go, they were known to be the best retrieval teams in the elemental nations, able to steal information without anyone knowing about it, and their merchants were all best in the business. This is why their clan was known to be the richest clan, a definite relation to Hermes. Their theaters were known to be the most entertaining, given how talented they were with music and poetry, as well as their marvelous works of art. I can see the relation to both Dionysus and Apollo. Though, I remember the Uzumaki clan was known for their pranks, and if you are on the receiving end, well you can say goodbye to your sanity, because an Uzumaki prank was considered a maddening experience, and only a lucky few have kept their sanity intact, very few. In battle, the clan was known for their fierce reputation to a point that all ninjas under the clan were all ASS rank. This was because of their abnormal chakra, allowing them to manifest golden chains from their body which they could manipulate to their will in battle. A prime example of this was Kashina, also known as the Kai Chishio no Habanero Red Hot-Blooded Habanero, due to her fierceness in battle, and the last thing her enemies would see was her luscious blood-red hair. Kashina was able to control her chakra chains to a degree that they could deflect almost all attacks, and she could easily subdue anyone including the Bijuru, which I can compare to the Titans, such as the Kayubi witch, who was regarded as the strongest Bijuru and her former tenant. I am proud to say that a rank was SS rank with a flea on site order meaning do not engage in combat. Yes Ares would have truly been proud of this clan. Now aside from their reputation in battle, the seals they made were all legendary. An example was a storage scroll. This scroll was made to store any and all items by creating a pocket dimension, meaning an Uzumaki can literally create their own dimension using seals. Yes, this is where Athena's relation to the clan comes in. Another seal, known for sealing Biju, was the Shakif Jin Dead Demon Consuming Seal. A seal only made possible due to the connection in relation to Hades, a seal that is able to consume an enemy's soul, but it is also a double-edged sword, at least for a non-Uzumaki, as the seal would also consume the user's soul. Now when my mortal shell traced the clan to the first Uzumaki, it discovered that she was the wife of the Sage of Six Paths. In the elemental nations, he was considered a god, and she was the daughter of both Zeus and Hare. I guess that, like me and the rest of the gods and goddesses, both of them took a vacation here in the elemental nation and had a child, but since they took up a mortal body, the child was was a demigoddess. My mortal shell couldn't find her name. Due to the fact that the Uzumaki clan was wiped out by the combined might of three of the five major villages, I suspected it was due to the fact that those villages grew jealous of the clan's rise to power and they felt threatened by them. These villages were, or the village hidden by clouds, Iwagakura, or the village hidden by rocks, and Kurigakur, more infamously known as the village of the bloody mist. Though I suspected someone in Kanoha also had a hand in this, since the seal barrier protecting the village was reportedly destroyed, and I know that no one in the clan would ever betray their own, so it had to be someone in Kanoha. But since my mortal body was destroyed, I wasn't able to find out who was responsible for it. From what Kashina told me, which was told to her by Mido, it nearly cost each of the villages involved all of their shinobi and kanoichi, since it took 10 squads to eliminate a single Yuzumaki and the Yuzukich was able to wipe out half of the army on her own. The clan fought hard until only the Yuzukich remained, but in the end, she too fell while Kanoha wasn't able to reach them in time, but that was only on paper. In the actual reports my mortal shell found, Kanoha didn't know about the attack until after it occurred, which didn't make sense as the clan would have sent a messenger bird. My mortal shell suspected that it was intercepted, or it did reach the village, but was never delivered to the third Hokage. To my knowledge only Kashina, being in Kanoha already, and Mido, since she was married to the first Hokage, were the only two survivors 
survivors. When she heard this, she was devastated by the news. But to my shock and admiration she remained strong, stating that, even if our country is gone and our people wiped out, so long as there is one Uzumaki who carries our beliefs that the bond of family runs deeper than the village itself, then the clan can rebuild. Unlike Kanoha, who preach about how you should give your life for the village, the Uzumaki believe that family and its people were what matters, not the village. I remember what she added. Our home is where our heart is. It is not just some place, but where our bond is at its strongest. I know there are other Uzumaki still alive, and that they are in hiding, because we are too stubborn to die. My admiration for her was beyond what words could ever explain, and her strength to persevere was beyond what any hero or immortal could ever know. Truly she was a demigoddess like no other. As I begin to reminisce the days I spent in my mortal self's memories, I stumbled upon the valley of end, and, in the middle of it, was my son in a team with a duck ass for a head. Wait no, hairstyle. I quickly recognized the teen was in Ichiha due to the crest on the back of his shirt, which was torn due to those ugly hand-like wings on his back. I saw my son in the Ichiha clash. The latter was knocked back. I smirked to see how powerful my son has grown. I was about to leave until I saw something that made my blood boil, and my wrath skyrocket. Kakashi, my old student, stabbed my son in the back, literally. I quickly made my way to my son, and ripped my former student in half. Then I quickly check on my son's condition. Poison I thought in horror. I pulled out some nectar and gently poured it into my son's mouth, while helping him swallow it, since he was unconscious. I could see red energy forming around him, Kyubi. At least the fox was good for something I thought. It seems the Kyubi was easing my son's pain. I couldn't understand why Kakashi would try to kill my son. Did he not know that Naruto is my and Kashina's son? I decided to peer into my son's memories. It wasn't part of my ability, but it wasn't something I couldn't do either, and what I saw made me want to level my mortal self's former village straight into Tartarus. The only reason why I didn't was because of the people who have helped my son, the people of the Red Light District and the people from Kushina and Naruto's, unsurprisingly. Favorite Raymond stand, Ichiraku Raymond. This world doesn't deserve my or Kushina's son. I couldn't agree more. I turned around, to my surprise, to see the goddess of the hearth, home, and family, Hescha. I'm surprised to see you here. When did you arrive, and did you just agree with me? I asked. I arrived shortly after you did, though I am not surprised to see you here, and the reason I agree with you, is because I deduce from your expression and through that mortal's actions, that my grandson had lived an unpleasant life, she said. I shared the memories I saw from Naruto with Hescha, and her expression quickly darkened to anger and disgust. Those filthy mortals. She said in rage before turning around to, I assume, level the entire village. I put a stop to that though. Why are you stopping me? She asked. I narrowed my eyes and spoke in a calming tone. Did you not see the people who have helped my son and your grandson? Leveling the village would harm them. Naruto here considers them his circuit family and precious people. I pointed out which calmed her down. The goddess of hearth took a calming breath. Yes, you are correct. I wouldn't want my grandson to hate me for harming what he considers precious to his heart. Instead I shall place a curse to all those who have harmed him or have ill intent against my grandson. Their family shall be torn and their homes ruined. And it shall be passed to their children and their children's children. Until none of them remain. And with a loud boom her curse was placed. With that said, both goddesses, with Naruto, left the elemental nations through a portal that would take them back to their own dimension. The skies over the elemental nations suddenly darkened. Not long after, it started to rain as if the skies were in tears. The world of Shinobi was never going to be the same again. Pa Venz. The day after Naruto was taken from his world found the blonde Jinchkriki resting on a soft bed. The sounds outside the windows seemed to wake the blonde. Slowly exposing his piercing cerulean blue eyes, Naruto bolted up and looked around. This place was not his apartment in Kanoha. Well, to be frank, he camped in the forest of death, filled with ridiculously large animals and other creature. Strangely, they never once bothered the blonde, nor was it the small clinic in the red light district. Since the nurses or doctors formed the Kanoha hospital would either kick him out and not treat him for his injuries, or try to kill him. Looking around the apartment, which looked very expensive and high-end, he noticed a scrawl addressed to him. My little maelstrom, I am sorry for what I did to you all those years ago. Yes I am the fourth Hokage, but I am also your father, of sorts. My name as you know was Mean and Amicus, I understand and won't blame you if you hate me. But know that I will always love you, now, I and your grandmother have taken you away from Kanoha, from the elemental countries even, you are in a nation called the United States, in a place called New York City, though I am dead as Minato Namikus, I am still alive, but thanks to a certain law I cannot truly be in your life, don't worry though, we'll meet in time, that is, if you want to, when the time comes, I will be happy to see you, now, since you are still young, you have to go to school in this world in a school of your choosing, and the seal at the bottom of the scroll, you will find all that you need in this world, such as books containing the history and language of the world, if you want to learn all the language and history that is, and also money, oh, just for a reference for the future, read up on Greek mythology, you will need that info, trust me, be safe my son and remember both your mother and I love you with all our heart, mean and amicus, Naruto was silent for a moment as he finished reading the letter from his technical father, 
but the blonde strangely didn't find it weird, knowing that there is a certain jutsu that is able to recreate a male reproductive organ, he reads to him, so it wasn't strange to him, for the first time in a long time, tears flowed down from his eyes, they weren't tears of sadness, but happiness, I do have a family Naruto thought, the thought of it was a fantasy for him, to know that your parents didn't abandon you, that they were out there, and that they care, the feeling was too profound to explain, at least to him, Naruto took in some air to relax and calmed himself down, well kid, looks like you do have a family, but let's do away with that for now, right now you have a lot of things to do in this new world that deep voice inside his mind said, Naruto smirked, I know Kikbi, first things first, get all this information into my head, and thanks to my cage bunch in jutsu, I can work on that fast, I will also need to find a way to obtain more money, hopefully there are jobs for someone who can take on an army he thought, and we'll be with you all the way Naruto sama, a melodic feminine voice, also in his head, said, my sister is correct my lord, though I do hope this world is ready for someone like you, a demonic and bloodthirsty voice said in his head, Naruto smiled, smiled and began to laugh in glee, well, Ma would not have brought me here if she didn't think it wasn't, I will miss my precious people in the leaf, but this place is my new home now, and I actually have a parent and relatives out here, it will take time, but I can get used to this place he said to the voices in his head, Naruto then walked out to the balcony of his new apartment and took in his surroundings and smiled, he then puffed out his chest and took in a deep breath before he said, Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze has arrived a ha ha he shouted and laughed happily, in an undisclosed location, somewhere in a South American shipment port, Fox, this is eagle eye confirm radio connection. Vixen this is fox radio connection is confirmed. A voice belonging to one Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, who is currently wearing a black stealth nanofiber suite, designed for tactical stealth mission. Good. Now I don't need to remind you how important this mission is. Considering who our clients are, a feminine voice said over the earpiece radio. I know, as long as the intel they gave us is good, then you have nothing to worry about, Naruto responded. He summoned three shadow clones, and mentally ordered them to arm up. Naruto's weapon of choice was two Silence 57 pistols, a Silence Ballista PSR with knighted dual band scope, some grenades, and a bow he affectionately named the Predator Bow. This bow has enough kinetic energy to stop a rhino dead with 20 regular carbon impact arrows, 10 electroshock arrow, when shot at an enemy, electrocute stuns them, 10 super thermite arrows, when shot at an enemy or wall or anything for that matter, stick and explode with some splash damage and 10 airburst fragmentation arrows that will explode upon impact and cause splash damage over a relatively large area. Are you guys prep and ready? Naruto asks his clones. All his clones nodded, all of them using the same weapon, a silenced Chikum CQB, 3 round burst, bullpup SMG, grenades, and a silenced TAC 45 pistol, and wearing the same cloths the original was currently wearing, aside from the masks they wore. Good. Get on the boat and let's move out Naruto ordered. A and I like Call of Duty for a zombie mode. In Crisis 3-4, well, the sweet, who doesn't want to wear that Nano sweet, and multiplayer Xbox and PS player here. I still think it should have been the two of us working on this assignment, not that I don't enjoy a little group action, but I prefer if it is just the two of us, Naruto's partner complained. The blonde could practically see the pout on her face. Well, who better to entertain our guests than you? After all, who's best at handling and working crowds around her fingers like puppets? Naruto heard a scoff, then a hum. You're referring to her last mission in Baltimore. What was it again at the underground fight arena? Yes, well, what can I say? The crowd loves me, she said with a giggle, letting out a contented sigh at the end. But calling the mission in Baltimore, Naruto rolled his eyes at a comment. It was to infiltrate the underground fight arena and search for an illegal drug smuggler, known for orchestrating illegal underground fights, where kidnapped people are forced to fight for their lives in a fight to the death. Naruto posed as a fighter while his partner was the new announcer. Since the last one had a tragic accident, the crowd loved her sunny personality. Well, more like sadistic personality. His partner was known in the business as a bloody sadist, whose reputation earned her titles like the Bloody Lady, Red Queen, or the Mad Vicento name a few. Remember Naruto, all personnel at the shipment port are to be treated as hostiles, and confirm the cargo manifest as indeed illegal weapons. So basically, they don't know what is in the container only that it is valuable. Is this going to be another Mission 32? Naruto asked, recalling one of their contracted missions, which sounded the same. The contents of the package was nothing more than diamonds, not smuggled weapons, though later it became their payment after their employer tried to kill them both. No, this won't be like that mission. The intel report says the cargo of value is to be bought on the market. It could be weapons. The air surveillance photo we got showed how much manpower they had protecting the cargo, was Naruto's partner's response, making the blonde sigh in slight frustration. Fine, but that secondary squad better not be late once the party starts. As good as I am, I can't can't handle all of the party guests. It's not that Naruto couldn't handle them on his own, but he was not about to underestimate these people. 
First rule of warfare in combat, never underestimate your enemy. Doing so could lead to your death. He's strong, that's for sure, but he wasn't dumb. He's smart and he is cautious, taking into account any and all possible scenarios in the mission. Don't worry Fox, the second squad is on standby and is ready to assist, in case things go to hell. Besides, I personally know from experience that you don't disappoint was her reply. She added a bit of huskiness to her voice, but Naruto knew she was just teasing. Well, your confidence in me, helps me relieve some stress. Naruto shot back, eliciting a giggle of amusement from his partner before turning his attention to his clones, just as they arrived at the south end of the port. Alright, I'll provide watch on top of that crane. While three of you split up in three different directions, the cargo is marked on our hub. And remember, all personnel are to be considered hostile. Naruto stated getting a nod from his clones. Good, let's move out. Naruto quickly climbed, well, more like walked up to the top of the crane, and used his chakra to balance himself on top. As to not fall to the ground, he wasn't concerned about falling. Naruto just didn't want to be distracted when aiming. It allowed him to have steady aim on a high and ridge position. And C1, you have two hostiles coming your way observing. Hull position Naruto set through the mental link he and his clones shared. Naruto watched, through the night enhanced scope, two hostiles packing a Scorpion Evo SMG. Looks like the two of them are separating. Pick your target, and I'll take out the other. Naruto watched as his clone went for the second hostile wearing a red jacket, which left him with the first hostile wearing a black jacket. Naruto steadied his breathing and controlled his heart rate, compensating for gravity, and taking into account the wind speed. Naruto fired hitting the hostile right in the head, and his clone took the second guy out, by snapping his neck, and C1. You close to two of the target containers, confirm cargo Naruto ordered. The Naruto clone found a cargo container and broke the lock, boss, looks like the intel is spot on. I found a U of attack drone, checking the second container now the clone said. Dixon, this is Fox, the first container contains a U of attack drone, checking the second container. There was a bit of silence for a few seconds. Acknowledged, keep me updated. See, told you there was nothing to worry about. Naruto was about to respond until, boss second cargo contains the drone's missile ordnance. The blonde stopped and frowned. Dixon, the second contains the Yuva's missiles. Placing a tag, I place the tag, have the secondary team ready, so they can. Sorry my foxy friend but no, that area has been designated a dead zone. Destroyed the weapons, meaning feel free to blow it all up, his partner said with glee in her voice, cutting him off. And C1, placed the explosion tags on both the Yuva and the missiles the clone did so, and planted the explosion seal tags on both weapons. Naruto then turned his attention back to his other clones. Boss, I'm inside the warehouse shipment office, and I found several backlisted shipment orders, advise his second clone said. Hmm, the warehouse is near the primary cargo, and C2 you have permission, but make a quick Naruto set before turning to the last clone, who took out another hostile with his gun. The blonde saw three hostiles heading towards his third clone, and C3, three hostiles are heading your way, hide the body and prepare to take them. The clone hid the body, while the original lined up his shot. Naruto followed one of the guards. From what he observed, it looked like the guy was about to take a piss. Last one you'll ever take the blonde thought when he fired. The two guards heard the thought and turned around. Their shock state was all that the clone needed to kill them. And C3, check the cargo now. Well you're still clear as Naruto said that. Another hostile turned up around a corner. Should Naruto cursed and had no other choice but to fire. Missing the target, the bullet hit one of the cargo containers. Alerting the clone, the clone turned around and quickly fired. That was close boss Naruto agreed and shook his head. The blonde didn't like using guns guns, and preferred to use his blades or his bow, though his partner would beg to differ. But Naruto's argument with her is you don't need to reload and give your enemy time to kill you or delay yourself in battle. And you couldn't reuse bullets. And you worry about how many magazines you have left. Naruto's partner would be stubborn about it. And the blonde dropped it, arguing with the opposite sex was far too troublesome and a headache. Though he could see the logic and the use of using guns, though it wasn't his cup of tea. And C3, report on your findings Naruto didn't receive a response. There was a moment of pause, making the blonde narrow his eyes at the lack of a response. And C3, report Naruto pressed. And C3 puffed. The boss gave the signal to move out, and we split in three other directions, while boss took the elevated position to provide cover fire. I took to the right side, while my fellow clone, and C1, took to the left, and NC2 took to the middle, heading towards the warehouse. This wasn't the first time the boss made use of us clones. Usually it was him and her, his handler and partner for missions or contracts. During the first three weeks the boss stayed in New York. He was trying to find a job. He found some here and there, but it didn't suit his lifestyle or his profession. It felt like another endless d rank mission. Though there was one mission he didn't complain about, it was when the boss took a job as a delivery boy. The boss made use of his skills. In this word it is called Parker, to deliver packages or, on occasion, food. One delivery I recall was in this high class looking apartment to a woman the boss felt lost for words for. She had long black hair with silver tips, brilliant green eyes, and a smile that gives the word radiant meaning. 
But what the boss noted most of all was her warm, comforting personality, and her wise traits that the boss had never seen or felt before. Another thing the boss noted was her motherly or something the boss yearned for, and it simply made him feel like a child who looked lost and wanted his mother to hold him, along with a sense of familiarity towards her. And it seems the woman sensed this in the boss. She invited him in and had a talk with the boss. The next thing the boss knew he was telling her about his past, how he was kicked out of the orphanage, how the people would hurt him, but he didn't tell her about him being a shinobi, since he didn't want her to think he was crazy. The walls he built around himself simply crumbled beneath her warm aura. The next thing the boss knew he was being hugged, and words of comfort were being whispered into his ear. It felt so alien to him, being hugged like this, and it made the boss think, was this what it is like to have a mother? Was this the warmth only a mother could provide? He didn't know because he was in tears as she told him to let those built up emotions go. Since then, every now and then, the blonde would visit the kind woman, Ray, and the boss would honestly drop the mask he wore and be himself, or rather, be someone he didn't think he could, someone normal. Someone who didn't have to worry about the world around him. He could be childish, smile a true smile and laugh happily. Currently there are only two people in this world that Naruto would not wear his mask around. And simply relaxed with, Rei and his partner. Oh yes, the boss's partner. She had some weird energy in her. Almost like Chakra. Though at the same time it wasn't. The boss first met her while he was looking for something more suited for his skills as a trained soldier or living weapon. He had been getting restless. It wasn't until he overheard some people arguing. What caught boss's attention was that the guys were complaining about how difficult the mission was that the woman had picked for them. Long story short, the guys quit, and the boss had a talk with his new handler and partner. The best way to describe their line of work was that both she and the boss are mercenaries. But, unlike mercenaries, they aren't hired, no, they take missions, call contracts, from a guild. The boss could easily compare the contracts to the missions of Kanoha. Unlike Kanoha, they choose the contracts and, at most, the boss's partner would pick the high level missions. If, say, there was a way of comparing the level of difficulty of the mission, it could be compared to the levels of missions back in the elemental nation. S rank being the highest and D rank being the lowest, the missions the boss's partner would pick are A rank or close to S rank. It was 8 months into the job when a certain incident forced Naruto to reveal his abilities. Mission 32, again, long story short, she wanted to know just how and what could cause a massive wall to suddenly shoot up out of the ground and block a hail of bullets, then how could said wall create spears to impale their former employer. The boss admitted it, since by now he had come to trust her. This was also the first time the boss used any sort of jutsu in this dimension. Boss didn't see the need to use any jutsu against people of this dimension or on missions, that, and he didn't want to attract unwanted attention. Besides, he could still use his other skills or the ones he had learned to accomplish missions without the need to use jutsu or chakra. After that event, the boss's partner took up more and more dangerous missions. Currently, the mission was search and destroy. As I'm used on that, I saw two guards taking a smoke break. I quickly disposed of the two guards, and quickly made my way to one of the cargo containers, where another guard was sitting down reading a porn magazine. Well, I hope he liked what he saw, because it was the last thing he'll ever see before I put him down. I then heard the boss say three guards were heading my way and ordered me to hide the body. I quickly did so and waited. I didn't have to wait long as one of the guards separated from the other two. Not long after that there was a subtle thud, alerting the two guards. I capitalized on their shock and quickly fired, killing off both guards. I got out of my hiding spot when all of a sudden, I heard a metal clang behind me. I turned around to see another guard and fired, hitting the guy in the chest area. I joked with the boss on how close the encounter was. I heard him grumble, agreeing with my statement. He then ordered me to check the cargo container. I found said cargo and opened it up, and what I found almost made me dispel from disgust. Normal pov. Also damn it the clone sounded disgusted. Understandable, since his clones would sometimes develop their own emotions or personalities. Most of the time it was his masks that would be usual personas. Naruto was silent. His eyes were overshadowed by his bangs. Memories of a certain mission back in the elemental nations came flooding back to his mind, and the blonde had to bite down on his lips, drawing blood, to calm himself down. While what Naruto's partner sounded dumbfounded at what she had heard. You heard me, asked our employer if they knew about it. Naruto all but shouted. He quickly realized his emotions were rising up. The blonde took in some air and pushed those memories of that particular event back. He couldn't afford to let his emotions go wild now. Fox, our employer didn't have prior knowledge of this, but they suspected those bodies belonged to a number of women who have gone missing over the past month. Place a tag on the cargo. A retrieval team is being prepared to retrieve the bodies. At least the families of these unfortunate women would have some closure. And C3, place a marker on the cargo containing bodies and any others you can find. And C2, report on your findings Naruto ordered his third clone, before turning his attention to his second clone, and C2 Pov. Once I was separated from the boss and my fellow clones, I headed straight for the warehouse. I treaded carefully and avoided the cameras, at least they have some sort of security, 
I got on top of one of the containers and saw two guards patrolling the area and another two guarding the entrance. I observed and timed their movements, awaiting the perfect time to make my move. 20 seconds, that was my time frame. I quickly threw a screw to attract one of the guards' attention, but to my slight surprise and delight, both of them decided to check what the noise was. Once they were behind the container I fired, killing them both. I saw the two patrolling guards making their way back to the warehouse entrance. I could see both of them looking around, trying to figure out where the other two had gone. Once they stared back at each other, I dropped the first guy, and then used the momentary shock to kill the last guy before entering the warehouse. I could sense there was only a single guard in the warehouse, making me think how lax the security is. It must have been because they were confident that no one knew about their operation and so forth. But if there is something true about this life, it's that secrets have a way of revealing themselves. One way or another, you can't keep a secret forever. And if you could, Congress. But it would always cost something to keep such a secret, well secret. Silently, I made my way to the office, mindful to avoid any cameras or other sensors. And I soon reached my destination. I saw the guard looking over some sheets of paper extensively. Curious, I slowly crept up behind him and snapped his neck. I checked to see the contents of the paper and found delivery orders that were blacklisted and were to be sent to a private owner. I informed the boss and asked if I should check on the contents of the cargo. There was a bit of silence before I received permission, so long as I make it quick. I checked the first and closest blacklisted cargo's contents. I was shocked and about to call the boss, but he called in and sounded very agitated. Normal path. Boss I was about to contact you, the cargo that was blacklisted. There are women in here, from what they told me. The women they capture are to be sold off in auctions, and the unlucky few, their organs are to be harvested. Boss, some of these women are traumatized, and some if not all of them were raped the clone said. Naruto sighed in a bit of relief, at least there were some who are still alive. Vixen, my subordinate found those other missing women and they are alive. Have our employer prepare a medical team Naruto said. Fox, a medical team is being prepared, now continue wait. Incoming reports from the second team say Chopper is coming in. Indeed Naruto could hear the sounds of a helicopter heading for the west side of the port, the blonde then unsealed a camera designed to take long-range shots. The helicopter landed and a man stepped out along with five bodyguards. The man had tan skin, black eyes and brown hair and was wearing a dark blue shirt and cargo pants, over it was mesh body armor. Taking photos now sending, Naruto said taking the photos of the man before he sent it back to his partner for profiling. Fox, the person's name is Alexander Amir, wanted on multiple accounts of trafficking, extortion, selling illegal weapons, and is known to have connections to a known terrorist organization. The mission objective has changed. Capture Amir for interrogation. Use any means to capture the target. Disclaimer anyone with this name. This is purely coincidental. Naruto stood up and lowered the level of the restriction seals he placed around his body. He did this for two reasons, one was for training and the second, he knew he could rely too much on his chakra, and become too dependent on it, his eyes were closed, and he had already conveyed a mental order to his clones. Naruto switched from his sniper rifle to his bow and jumped down, channeling his chakra to the lower part of his body. He used this often back in Konoha when he stood on the Hulkage Monument, which could be compared to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, which Naruto guessed was about the same height as the Hulkage Monument. The blonde Jinchkriki opened his eyes, revealing not his piercing cerulean blue eyes, but a pair of cold crimson red slitted eyes. He wore an unreadable expression, almost void of any emotion, almost. The only emotion spotted was that of pure bloodlust, anger, and pain. The two former emotions were understandable, but the latter was something from his past, something that still pained him to no end. It was a pain that couldn't be healed or even ignored. I hate that memory, but I can't dwell on the past now, right now. It's time to hunt the blonde thought before ninja running towards his prey. Naruto leaped from one cargo container to the other, while his bow was at the ready. There, the former elemental nation shinobi spotted one guard and fired an arrow with the medium drawn weight. The guard turned around just in time to be impaled in the head by the arrow. The blonde retrieved the arrow and maneuvered from one container to another. He spotted two guards near the fence, jumping down. He took down the first guy, before kneeing the second guy in the face, causing the back of his head to hit the metal fence. And see one, is the trap set Naruto asked as he leaped over the fence, making his way towards his target. The blonde Jinchkriki counted at least 30 enemies, including the designated target and his bodyguards. The trap is set boss, me and NC3 are waiting on you the clone answered. Vixen, tell the second team that the party is about to start, make sure they have their party suites on. They're all set and ready, waiting on you fox, oh, and give them hell for me with you, love. Naruto allowed a smirk, albeit a sadistic smirk, to grace his lips, sure, Naruto saw one of his clones, he handed the clone the sniper rifle, while he made his way to the target. The blonde gave the clone the signal, and, not a second later, a loud explosion was heard, followed by another, even louder, explosion, sending a shock wave. Normally this would dispel Naruto's clone had the blonde shinobi not reinforced them with a lot more chakra. The second team entered from the front gate, and Naruto's clones provided some cover fire. A firefight was raging on, and the blonde was using the fight as a distraction to slip past the enemy line to capture the target. Naruto stopped when he saw Alexander making his way to the chopper. Oh no, you don't you fun. Naruto switched his 
his normal arrow to an airburst fragmentation arrow and shot the pilot. The helicopter exploded. Not a Hollywood movie explosion, but an explosion nonetheless. Alexander was thrown back slightly and shouted to get him out of there. He got in a black Hummer SUV that he probably got from one of the cargo containers and drove off. Naruto sprinted to cut him off before Alexander could escape. Dumping from platform to platform, container to container, Naruto's movements never wavered. He moved with such grace and speed that you would only see yellow blur. Alexander saw a blonde with a bow standing between him and his freedom, and ordered his guards to run him down, like that deer he killed. Naruto drew back his bow with a strong drawn weight for high damage and long range, though the downside was its drawing time. The arrow pierced the air as it flew towards its target, and the unlucky individual was the driver. The car swerved out of control, causing it to flip over. Naruto simply sidestepped, and the SUV crashed. The blonde switched to his pistol and fired at the guards who were attempting to get out of the downed SUV. Seeing Alexander limping away, Naruto fired at his legs, causing the man to scream out in pain. It's over Alexander, time for you to answer for your crimes. That was the lasting thing Alexander heard before he felt something hit the side of his head, knocking him out. Naruto carried Alexander's body over his left shoulder, and made his way back to the waiting soldiers. One of the soldiers saw blonde with a body over his shoulder and alerted the others. That must be him, the one the CIA hired, one of them said. They stood in attention and flinched when they saw Naruto's cold, expressionless face. Here's your trash, the blonde said in a monotone voice, before he harshly dropped the body of Alexander. Boss, these women, they need medical attention quickly. One of his clones called out. Instantly, Naruto softened his gaze and turned around to the group of women, who looked scared, hurt, and traumatized. Naruto slowly walked towards them and noticed them flinch in fear. He knew why. It's alright. We are not going to hurt any of you. A medical team is on its way to treat your injuries and ailment. Afterwards, we are going to return you to your loved ones, he said with a soothing voice, which seemed to work. Naruto heard a choir of sighs and saw them smile. For them, the nightmare is over. Vixen, all mission objectives have been accomplished. Good work Fox, our CIA employer is pleased with our work and offered to send us any future missions that require our skills and our assistance. The money has been transferred to our offshore account. I'll see you at home then. Naruto arrived at the hotel he and his partner were staying in for the evening, before heading back to New York City. The time was around midnight, and the moon was at its fullest. Normally this would lighten Naruto's mood as it always did in the past. But this was not the case. Having been reminded of that particular day, his mood was especially sour. He hated remembering that day, or rather that mission back in the elemental nations, though it did give him a chance to meet someone who he later fell in love with. Surprising, since the blonde-haired teen's outlook on love is severely lacking. He didn't know what love is, so he could only describe the feelings as an intense feeling that arose from the sea of his being. It was something unknown to him, and it would always plague him, till he read a book regarding love. So he could say he was in love, but at the same time he couldn't say he was only in love with just her. There was another person that held a string to his heart, someone who suffered similar to his past treatment, in his mind, and according to the book he read, he could love more than one person, and could be in a relationship with them, but it was to be their choice, not his. And if he were to add then they would have to approve. Oh and the book was on polygamy. Naruto truly cared about both of them, beyond the similarities of their past experience of being alone and hated for something beyond their control. It was their attitude, their character, and simply being themselves that attracted Naruto to these two women. He felt strong connections to them, though is not two anymore. He also felt lingering feelings for his partner and, unbeknownst to him, his partner had similar feelings, if not much stronger. Again, Naruto lived a life full of hate and grew up with prostitutes, criminals, and people who, like him, were undesirable by society. So his outlook and denseness came with good reason. Walking up to the room Naruto, unlocked the door with his key and stepped inside. He was greeted by a sight that would make any pervert a crude male blush with a nosebleed from the sheer sexiness of it all. Welcome back, my cute little fox, spoke a woman, sounding as seductive as ever. This was none other than Naruto's partner, who just got out of the shower. Water dripping down her creamy white skin with only a small towel covering her lower body, and another towel simply draped over her rather large f cup breasts. Her teal green eyes held a glint of mischief as she slowly turned around, showing Naruto her round plump posterior, while she dried her dark brown hair. If Naruto was any lesser man, then he would have jumped her right then and there. But his partner knew that, Naruto would never press on something unless she allowed it, which was why she was comfortable being around him naked. Well, maybe it was the fact that he grew up in a brothel. He wasn't unfamiliar with seeing naked women. He didn't feel anything about seeing a naked, sexy, and beautiful woman in all her glory. At first she felt dejected, as she thought Naruto thought of her in the norm. It wasn't until she caught Naruto looking at her one time. The brown-haired beauty noticed that it was less lustful and more appreciative, like she was a piece of fine art. She later found that her partner appreciated her 
not just because of her beauty, he liked her simply for being her, and because she wouldn't change to the wants or expectations of society. Moxie, good evening, Naruto greeted with a tiredly with a slight emotional edge, which Moxie caught. The blonde removed his clothing, leaving him in only his boxers, and lay down on the bed that he and Moxie shared. Madeline Mox, or Mad Moxie, could be summed up with a few words, sadistic, alluring, dangerous, and lustful, well, only towards a certain blonde. She enjoys violence in combat, being skilled with hand-to-hand -hand combat and weaponry. She taught Naruto how to handle and use a gun after all. Modesty has little to nothing do with Moxie, but she is very refined with her tastes, mannerisms and attitude. Despite her violent tastes, she is also friendly and rather compassionate when fighting is not involved, though only Naruto has ever seen this caring side of her. Most people only see the bloody queen people associated with. Naruto, tell me, what's wrong? Naruto had to blink once to make sure he wasn't seeing things. Moxie was surprisingly on top of him, and he hadn't even noticed her move. Sighing slightly, Naruto arched into a sitting position, leaning on the headboard. The mission just brought up some unpleasant memories from my old world, he said, dropping his psychological mask. Not many people get to see Naruto without his mask. It was either the goofy, energetic, brash, and spontaneous mask, or it was his cold, tactical, calm, and overall emotionless mask. Since coming to this world, Naruto made these masks to cope with the harsh treatment in Konoha. He hid his damaged emotional state, as well as the despair he felt growing up. For all his strength, all his power, Naruto was still that scared, miserable, and pain child who just wanted to be accepted as someone other than a plague, an abomination, a monster. Maxi wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck and laid his head on her breasts, in a warm and comforting embrace. She knew about her partner's past, and she saw the scars around his, otherwise flawless body. Moxie couldn't fathom the sheer stupidity or her disgust of the people from her Naruto's former village. She would have loved nothing more than to butcher, maim, torture, and kill those people in the most heinous ways possible. This was also the reason why Moxie greatly admired Naruto. The things he endured would have driven anyone insane and made them hateful towards the world. But he pushed through it, coming out as this strong, kind, and caring individual that Moxie had come to know and care for but she knew he was still damaged, and the wounds were still there. The quote time heals all wounds could not be associated with Naruto's, and the scars only proved that. Moxie felt a familiar warm, wet droplet of tears going down on her breasts, causing her to bring him closer to her, whispering comforting words to him. It was a minute in when she noticed Naruto had stopped crying. Now sleep, sleep well. My little fox she thought as she lay next to him. Inside Naruto Mindscape. Naruto opened his eyes and found himself in a familiar place. His Mindscape. In front of him were large golden bars and red crimson eyes staring back at him. Kayubi Naruto greeted as he slowly stood up and looked to his surroundings. As if he was looking for something, or rather someone. Come out you two, he said ordered. Out from the shadows of his Mindscape, two individuals came out. The first was a beautiful woman, with long braided blonde hair with a blue bow pale white skin, and a white cloth covering her DD cup breasts under a semi-transparent sheet. She also wore a semi-transparent miniskirt over her white panties, a white cloth over her feet, the cloth on her left arm. On her head, she wore gold and a glass helmet with a four-wing design and a diamond. She also had two long sparkling wings on her back. The second individual was a living inferno of a being with metallic feet, shin guards, armor, gauntlets, and metallic skull heads. Unlike the woman, who radiated warmth and love, this being was pure malice incarnate, simply screaming, bloodless personified. Elysium, Inferno. Naruto greeted the two sentient spirits, who kneeled in response, making the blonde slightly groan at their habit. He had told them there was no need for them to do such formal things. Him hating formal things like kneeling or referring to him as Sama or Lord being an example. Though, by now, Naruto had gotten used to them doing such things. Naruto-sama, we have sensed your emotional distress. What can we do to help? Elysium asked, ever faithful as the day Naruto found both their sword forms. It's nothing Elysium. The mission brought up unwanted memories from my past. But let us do away with that. Right now I need to further progress with my training, especially for that, Naruto said. The three beings inside his head perked up at this. So, you have yet to master that yet you want to add mastering my chakra into the mix. Not that I care what happens to you, but if you die, I die, and I don't want to reform in this place, Kayubi said. Naruto turned around to address the nine-tailed beast. I know Kurumi, and would you turn to your human or semi-human form, Naruto said. In an instant the Kayubi vanished and was replaced with a woman with long flowing red-orange hair, reaching down to her perky butt, G-sized breasts, caramel skin, a perfect her Douglas figure three defined whiskers on both sides of her face, red slitted eyes, fox ears, and nine flowing tails. She wore a blood red form fitted kimono with a black flowering design, modified to reach down to her upper knees and loose, giving a view of her breasts, and a neck choker with the kanji seal around her neck. My, my so much stress Nerukan, should I assume you requested me to change to my human form to relive it? Then by all means, come inside my cage and let me do so, Kayubi purred. But then she found herself bound in chains wrapping around her body in the most erotic way possible. I have no time for such games Kayubi. I am already angered as it is. I don't need, nor want, your antics to further such. Naruto emphasized by tightening the chains around Kurumi's body 
making her grunt in slight pain and pleasure. With a snap of the fingers, the chains vanished. So aggressive, though I do love aggression, Kuku Kayubi said, giggling at the last part, but stopped when she heard a growl of annoyance from her Jinchkriki. Fine, fine, change this place so we may begin. With another snap, Naruto's mindscape changed from the deceptive sower to the luscious forest of training ground 44, otherwise known as the forest of death, Naruto's regular training place, and where he spent the vast majority of his life in. The forest of death is considered in Kanoha to be a danger zone because of the large creatures, such as animals, insect, and monstrosities that call this place their home. That is why it was sealed off from the population, even during the Chunin exams, where this place was used to hold the second part of the exam. A section of the forest was used for this particular event. Naruto on the other hand called this place his actual home, his second home being Lilith's main brothel house. None of the residents of the forest ever bothered him, and the blonde assumed it was because of Kurumi or something else. Either way it made a great place to train in secret. Now, let us begin, shall we? Naruto said, summoning two dual connecting sides, while both Elysium and Inferno summoned their sword forms. Inferno Inferno's sword was crystalline in structure with a crimson hue, but with a trace of black hand, from what Naruto could tell, flesh in the interior, the blade itself was small and slim, a wing-shaped handguard, and a skull-like form in the middle, with an eye situated just above it. Elysium's sword was sleek in appearance with a crystalline, ice-like design, a handguard that resembled a feminine face with a blue crystal, situated just above it, and as slim as the Inferno's blade. From what Naruto could see from the blade itself, it had some kind of symbols that he couldn't distinguish or even read. Inferno was first to charge in, Naruto, anticipating this, jumped back. Both sentient spirits had a rather unique ability to them. Inferno's ability grants its user incredible strength to give an edge. In some cases, it can penetrate through defenses as well, chipping away health. The only drawback is the parasitic ability that drains the user's health, which was why the user would have to adapt to an almost offensive style. But with Elysium, his ability can regenerate a user's health at the same rate as Inferno's ability to drain health, along with boosting a grand amount of physical strength, meaning the user's stamina. While she may not be as powerful in terms of attack power, she is still as effective as her brother, since the two balance each other for their wielder. That is why Naruto distanced himself from Inferno. Naruto could not afford to clash with him at close range, opting for long range. Channeling his chakra into both his sides, Naruto sent several dark blue crescent-shaped waves, which Inferno blocked with his sword, before getting kicked back by his wielder. Naruto then quickly dodged an attack from Elysium. The blonde knew any attack against Elysium would all be ineffective because of her defensive capability and Naruto had to clash with her with more powerful attacks, which was contradicting to his normal style, but he had learned to adapt. Connecting his sides together, the blonde clashed blades with his fellow blonde, causing her to grunt a bit at the force of the attack. She jumped backwards when she noticed her wielder disconnecting his sides. That was the advantage of dual connecting sides. Even if the opponent blocked the first one, the second was sure to follow, and her wielder had mastered how to use this weapon to his full potential. She wasn't surprised when both her and her brother's sword forms were changed to fit his combat style. Both their appearances are similar to each other save the color, Inferno's being crimson red and Elysium's crystal blue, their respective facial appearance on the guard or heel of the side and their distinct features. Naruto dodged as a crimson wave came seconds from harming him. The blonde blocked Inferno's next attack. His left eye twitched when he felt his strength being drained. Using the force of the attack, Naruto leaned back, changing his center of gravity, then sidestepped to the left, causing Inferno to lose his footing and stumble forward. Inferno felt the cold unforgiving steel of his lord's side, signaling that he had already lost. The blonde was slightly surprised when he saw Elysium. Time slowed down, seeing her blade descend. Naruto reversed his grip on his side, and struck Elysium's sword hard at its guard, causing her to lose her grip on the sword, which flew into the air. She too felt her wielder's blade on her neck, signaling that she had lost. It seems we have lost brother. It would seem so sister. They both sat as Naruto removed his scythe from their neck, by slicing their heads off. In one motion Naruto spun around with his scythe close to their necks. Elysium's head fell to the ground, while Inferno's blood gushed out from his neck. Their bodies fell down with a thud, and their blood flowed like a river. Naruto panted before ordering, reform. There was a bright light, and the two sentient beings were back, healthy and alive. Both of them won't die or fade away since they're not part of the natural order of things. Arsh as ever, my lord, Inferno commented with a bloodthirsty grin. It's combat, if I gave my opponent a chance to surrender, they would have a chance to kill me, he said logically. Inferno boomed in laughter, only in combat, only in the battlefield will he ever see such a harsh side of his master. I suppose so my lord, he said. Naruto sent an apologetic look to Lysium, who raised a hand, I understand my lord, and it matters not to me, so no need to apologize, though I appreciate the gesture, she said, seeing the kind part of her master. That was very entertaining, Narukan Kayu be said with an amused voice and a smile that clearly said she was turned on by Naruto's display. How long till you regain your yin side? Naruto asked, referring to the yin side that his technical father sealed within her body. 
which Naruto retrieved from the corpse. It shouldn't be long now before my yun sight is fully restored, and we can finally start with you mastering my chakra. Give it a month or so, she informed. Naruto nodded and sat down. It wouldn't be the first time and I don't need to mess with your emotions to do so, she said as she turned his head to face her and kissed him passionately. Naruto and Kurumi have a strange kind of relationship. They would have sex, but they weren't a couple or even friends. It was either him or Kayubi that initiated. Kurumi more so than Naruto. So Naruto was confused, or rather he was dense. Kurumi had developed feelings for the blonde as he grew up. At first, she denied or shot down such thoughts, him being her jailer and all. But as time passed, she slowly came to realize that her feelings for Naruto and knew she couldn't deny it. Her instincts roared at her, telling her that he is her destined mate. She desired all of it, his darkness, his warmth, his coldness, that ever-present determination and that sheer aura of dominance. Everything screamed perfect mate in her opinion, or rather, her instincts, like a moth to fire. Kurumi felt drawn towards him, and knew she couldn't get away. Kurumi could go on and on about what she loved about Naruto, like his determination, his strength, that unwavering will to push forward even when everything around him wants him dead. Naruto didn't stop and push through with perseverance without succumbing to his darkness. On the contrary, he accepted it, and used it to fuel his want to become strong and the result was the person she was currently kissing. Oh Naruto, if you weren't so dense you would know how much I love you, like that partner of yours or even those two women you came to care for. After all, he knows you better than I do she thought. She moaned when she felt Naruto's hand caressing one of her tails. It should also be noted that Naruto didn't blame her for the death of his parents, even when he knew who the cause of it was. He still didn't blame her. The phrase he used could be similar to you don't blame the gun for the person who fired it. But now, he is in this world. Naruto was forced to let go of revenge, which was difficult since it was part of the reason he trained to the point of death. Now he is looking for a new goal, and Kayubi hoped he would find one. Behind the two, Elysium glared at Kayubi for such provocation and perverse actions. Inferno, on the other hand, was watching with popcorn and soda that he found somewhere. This should be good. What was the current record ah? 16 hours of non-stop riding like bunnies in heat, and that was the first round he thought. Naruto broke off the kiss, much to Kayubi and Inferno's disappointment with the latter much more vocal getting a smack from his sister and the former inwardly groaning in displeasure. I'm too tired Kurumi, mentally and spiritually, some other time, I promise, he said, giving her a reassuring smile. One of the things Lilith taught him, aside from how to please a woman, was that a gentleman doesn't leave a woman displeased or unsatisfied. But Naruto was too tired, and his emotions had yet to calm down. Fine, next time I expect you to be an animal, Kayubi said with a slight huff, though she understood why. Naruto felt his consciousness leaving his mindscape. Knowing he was about to leave, he gave Kurumi a breathless kiss, making her shudder in delight. Before she could return the gesture, Naruto vanished. You know, there are other ways for cheering someone up, Kayubi, Elysium said still maintaining her cold glare. The nine-tailed fox merely waved her off with her right hand in a shooing motion. I know, you virgin prude, but it would be less pleasurable and more boring. Besides, do you honestly expect me to know how to deal with human emotion? Well half human, but that is beside the point, and can you really blame me? After all I am Yaokai, or am I an Inari, and by the species that the sage made me from. I am a lustful being, she said with no shame, though she knew other ways of cheering Naruto up. She knew and would argue that sex would be much more effective. Inferno sighed as he tried to cover his ears as the two women began to argue, and hoped that they would stop soon, which he knew they wouldn't. Women are troublesome that way in his opinion. Outside of Naruto's mindscape, Naruto woke up and expected weight on his chest. Instead, he found himself looking up at the ceiling of his apartment in New York. My clone must have summoned me. Better email Moxie Naruto thought before proceeding to do just that. The seal Naruto developed was based off of the summoning scroll and intensive research on summoning in general. While he was back in the elemental nations, after countless experiments, cementing in failure and causing extensive damage to the test subject he used, which were either his clone or fruit, he was finally able to recreate the way to summon, similar to summoning an animal from a summoning scroll. He cleaned himself up since today was his school's field trip to a museum. As he went into the bathroom, his phone rang, sighing a bit, Naruto answered the phone, knowing full well who was at the other line. Morning Naruto, I got your message, though I'm slightly irked that my morning pillow and the warmth it provides was missing. I let it slide as soon as you use that technique the mistress of blood said, referring to his jutsu. Can I do it after a shower? Though, that's even better, hurry up and use that technique of yours, so I can join you. Sighing again, Naruto didn't have the energy or the will to argue with her. Left with no other option, Naruto reverse summoned his partner. Hopefully she remembered to bring her bags this time the blonde thought, recalling the first time he used this technique with her. There was a familiar poof sound, and the smoke cleared, revealing Moxie, naked as the day she was born with her numerous luggage behind her. Well, shall we, my cute little fox, she chirped, grabbing Naruto by the wrist and dragging him to the bathroom. Moxie, no sex, and don't give me that look, I have a trip to go on, again, don't give me that look, we'll have sex later, okay. Naruto's voice echoed through the room. Moxie, that is not my back. Well, your log doesn't seem to mind. Ugh, why do I put up with you again? 
Many reasons, my cute little fox. One of them is sex. Second is that I'm your handler. And third, well, sex. Your honesty suits my heart. I'm getting in the tub. Oh, it's warm, just the way I like it. Now ain't this relaxing? Though I digress, we could do a more effective form of stress relief, she said, while shaking her hips slightly on Naruto's tool. The blonde chuckled slightly and shook his head. His partner was annoying sometimes, but he knew she meant well. Yeah, that would be nice, but my mood is still sour mocks, he said, looking up with a rather sullen look. I took note of the mission and noticed that there is a similarity between this mission and one of the missions you told me from your world. I'm guessing it is that mission that involves her correct. Moxie's answer came with an affirmative nod from her blonde partner and love interest. The brown-haired beauty knew how much it stung the blonde, and how painful it was for him. Moxie turned her body around and wrapped her arms around Naruto's neck, and brought him close into a hug. It wasn't your fault Naruto, and you know she wouldn't want you to grieve like this. She would have wanted you to move on, she said softly. Yeah you're right, she's that kind of person. I just wish I could have done more. No, I know I could, but I was too no I can't even say that sigh thank you Moxie. He simply said, though Naruto's companion knew he was still hurt and it would take time for him to get over his funk. Until then, she would remain by his side. Anytime love, anytime. After a while, the two got out of the bathroom and got dressed. Naruto was wearing a black long sleeve polo jeans, and Converse shoes. Moxie wore a black corset overlapped by a leather jacket, leather jeans and thigh-high boots, which were modified with a hidden blade. You sure you want to go with me? It might get boring, Naruto said. Since visiting a museum wasn't what Moxie would normally like to do or even consider doing. Moxie responded by playfully poking Naruto's forehead. I am, besides, like you, I have this curiosity about Greek history, she said, wrapping her arms around Naruto's right arm as they left the building, and got in Naruto's Bentley GTC convertible. It's a good thing that there is no traffic today, cause traffic in New York, damn. So tell me about this school of yours. Not much to tell really. Yancey Academy is a simple private boarding school teaching subjects such as pre-algebra, English, and Latin. Most of the students are troubled kids. Like this one kid I know. Perkins no wait, Peter no Hma Percy. Yes that's his name. It seems he has the same symptoms that we have. You mean dyslexic and ADHD? Yes, though I do feel some weird energy similar to yours but very different. And his friend, um Gordon. No Gaby maybe Grover that's his name. Though he smells of goat, and Percy smells like the ocean. Oh and what do I smell like? Fresh rosemary and honey. How accurate, two lust foods. Fufu. Few -few. Naruto chuckled. It's true though, from what the blonde knew about food. Those two are considered part of the 12 lust foods. And he found it odd that his partner has this scent on her. Well anyways. Not all students are troubled kids, some students are from well-off rich families, meaning most of them are spoiled brats, he said, turning the next corner and seeing the school bus. The students and the two teachers stopped whatever they were doing, and saw the school student council president and head disciplinary committee car park. All the female population blushed at the sight of Naruto, and the males also blushed when they saw Moxie, especially the cloths she wore. Naruto scanned his surroundings, and his eyes landed on a certain wheelchair teacher. Hmm, a concealment technique Naruto thought, recalling how suspiciously Mr. Brunner came to be employed at the school. An old crow named Mrs. Dodds had the same concealment technique around her making them both targets until proven otherwise. Hmm, Mr. Brunner smells of a horse's ass, and Mrs. Dodd smells of decay. If they do prove to be hostiles, then I'll have to eliminate them the blonde thought before hooking his arm around Moxie, making the people think they were both a couple. Many of the students quickly quieted down and remained where they were, lest they want to suffer the blonde's wrath and severe punishment. But unfortunately, some students have yet to notice the blonde. Naruto saw some food being thrown at a crippled kid who the former Leaf Shinobi identified as Grover Underwood. I'm not in a mood for this he thought, and, in a blink of an eye, Naruto pulled Grover back, avoiding the wads of peanut butter and jelly. Naruto turned his gaze to who both threw and wasted perfectly good food. His cold, piercing eyes landed on one Nancy Boba Fett and her friends who froze under the blonde's gaze and started sweating bullets, knowing how screwed they were. Picking up the food from the ground, Naruto made his way towards the school bully and her lackeys, while channeling a bit of Kai, killing intent, and concentrating it towards the annoying girl. Once he was in front of them, Nancy and her friends felt like death was staring down on them. He did, he said in a cold tone that would freeze the underworld over. Beep beep but she stuttered and shrunk beneath Naruto's gaze. Beat her else he said, and suddenly a demonic mask materialized behind the blonde. Blood was flowing out from its mouth and eyes, while red glowing eyes were looking down on them, as if begging them not to, so it could devour them. Out of fear Nancy shoved the food, which was on the grass, down in one go. Good, next time don't waste food or else, he said with a sickening sweet smile that promised pain. Naruto walked back towards Grover and Percy, both petrified in fear. Underwood, be more mindful of your surrounding, and Jackson be more attentive, would you kindly, he said, still wearing that sickeningly sweet smile. It didn't help that the demonic mask was still behind him. Both teens nodded. Good. And just like that, the mask disappeared as Naruto turned around to leave. Until... Um, Naruto, could I ask you a question? Percy said, mustering enough bravery to do so. Naruto turned his head sideways and nodded. Um, what was that? 
I mean that demonic mask that was behind you, the sea green eyed teen asked nervously. The blonde gave him an innocent look that looked all too fake, and tilted his head a bit. You must be seeing things Percy, is the heat getting to you? Do you feel dizzy? Did you not take your morning grains? Because I do not know what you are talking about, Naruto answered in a fake innocent tone. Bullshit both teens thought. Well, in any event, you are allowed to eat during the tour, so long as you remember to throw your trash in the proper recycling bin. Now hurry along the tour is about to start, with that said. The enigmatic blonde rejoined his partner. Common Percy, Grover said while shaking his head. Yeah was Percy's response since he wasn't sure if Naruto meant it or not. Naruto hooked his arms around Moxie, who gave him a bloodthirsty and lustful grin. My, you were so dominant there my cute little fox. She was in a husky tone while pressing her impressive bust on his arms, making me feel hot under the weather. You better take responsibility for this later she said. The blonde shook his head and wonder how he puts up with her quirks, but he guessed that that's what he likes about her. It was her quality and her honest personality, along with her attitude that he truly liked, and her beauty and sexiness was just a bonus to him. He got used to Moxie's quirks and accepted it. Besides, he wouldn't and won't have her change who she is for anything. Haha, maybe, who knows, he said simply. From the corner of his eyes, Naruto spotted an eight-year-old girl with mousy brown hair. Her eyes held an amount of warmth and care that the blonde had never seen before. The gust of wind caused him to blink, and when Harry opened them, the girl was suddenly gone. But he thought before turning his attention to the wheelchaired Latin teacher. Looking around the many statues depicting the Greek gods and goddesses of Olympus, Naruto, for some odd reason, felt a familiar feeling of connection that he only felt with the people who he viewed as his family. He especially felt drawn to one that depicted the goddess, Hasha. Just by looking at the statue, Naruto felt a sense of calm wash over him, and felt his growing negative emotions slowly receding, much to his confusion and delight. A smile graced his face, a smile that would normally be seen when he's around his precious people. The nose, maybe I may be related to them. Shaking his head at the thought, Naruto listened in to the Latin teacher, and noticed the class was starting to become noisier. Naruto was about to reprimand them when a comment from a certain annoying girl caused a sea green eyed teen to snap and practically yell at Nancy to shut up. Mr. Jackson. Mr. Burner called out, said teen looked towards the wheelchaired man. Did you have a comment? He asked. The teen replied with a no, feeling embarrassed by his outburst. Mr. Brunner, it wasn't Jackson's fault. Boba Fett along with some of the class were being noisy. Naruto said in defense of the dark-haired teen, albeit stoically. This got a nod from Mr. Brunner, and a thankful look from Percy. But Jackson, leave the reprimanding to me and mind your words. Also any more inappropriate noise and violator will receive two weeks detention and three days community service. He lectured Percy first, then warned the class. This, of course, got a fearful nod from all the students. Now let us continue. Mr. Jackson, can you tell me about this picture? Mr. Brunner asked, pointing to one of the pictures on the stell. The picture seemed to incite an emotional sadness from Mr. Brunner when he looked at the female, which Naruto caught. Hmm. The blonde tugged on his partner's shirt, and Moxie knew what he wanted to do. The brown-haired beauty caught onto the flickering emotion from the Latin teacher too. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Percy answered. Yes, Mr. Brunner said, not looking that satisfied. And can you tell me why? Naruto nodded to Moxie to intervene and to get a response from Mr. Brunner. He ate his kids because of a prophecy telling him that his kids were going to kick him down from his pedestal, Moxie explained, getting a sigh of relief from Percy. Ha! Hey, if the so-called Titan Lord wasn't a paranoid schizophrenic and didn't get his panties in a bunch, then he wouldn't have eaten his kids, causing the prophecy, thus signing his own death warrant. He screwed himself over because his wife hit her last born, Zeus, and gave the Titan a rock to eat, but I guess he wanted something hard to swallow. She said the last part saucily, implying a double meaning to the last part, getting a lot of people to laugh, including Mr. Brunner. Anyway, when Zeus was all grown up, he tricked his dear old daddy into drinking and barfing up his brothers and sisters. You by the way. The female group agreed with her. Of course being immortals and all, they survived and were fully grown, surviving in the titan's stomach all those years. Hm, I imagine them saying, hey little brother what took you? Do you know how boring and how it smelled in there? Bah, doesn't matter give us a hug, Moxie joked, making everyone snicker and chuckle. They wage war against their tyrannical father and his cronies, with the help from some cyclops and hackatonkers, or hundred arms for those who don't know. Zeus managed to convince a cyclops by the name of Bronze to forge him and his siblings' powerful weapons, such as Zeus's magic glowing stick, Poseidon's massive fork, and a forehead protector for Hades. Now that common got Mr. Brunner to stiffen with an extremely worried look, but it was quickly gone. Naruto smirked, seeing as he got what he needed, but he only needed one more thing to further prove his theory. Long story short, after 11 years, the Olympians won, with help of course, and Zeus took his dear old daddy's scythe and sliced Kronos into pieces, before casting him and his followers into Tartarus, with the exception of Atlas, who was forced to hold the sky, Moxie finish, and inwardly grinned as she saw Naruto's smirk, meaning she accomplished her task. Like we're going to use this in real life, like it's going to say on our job application. Please explain why Kronos ate his kids, Nancy mumbled. It was still loud enough for Mr. Brunner to hear. And why, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Yuzumaki, to paraphrase Miss Bobafit's question, does this matter in real life, 
he said as the two teens, with the former glaring at the annoying girl, while the latter had an unreadable expression on his face. As it, Grover said with a slight smirk. Shut up, Nancy snapped Bart at Grover, while blushing as red as her hair because of the embarrassment she felt. Naruto decided to speak first to save Percy from embarrassment, since both Greek and Roman culture have significant impact in modern civilization and society, such as art, science, philosophy, laws, and warfare to name a few, he answered, not really caring as his mind was racing for a plan to get the teacher alone. Percy sighed as Naruto's answer not only shut Nancy up, but, more importantly, save him, since he wasn't able to think of an answer. Soon, everyone was outside eating their lunch, but, for some odd reason, the weather outside was starting to storm. Another odd thing, aside from Naruto, Moxie, Grover and Percy, no one seemed to notice. This feels like a Jinjutsu, but on a much higher scale Naruto thought. Then, all of a sudden, the blonde felt a fluctuation of power making him turn towards where he felt the fluctuation, and saw the water from the fountain rise up and push Nancy on her behind. His eyes widened slightly at that and turned to his partner who nodded confirmation. Percy pushed me. Nancy whined his missus. Dodds came right up to the sea green eyed teen. The blonde's instincts told him to follow the two. He followed them to a secluded part of the museum, and he could hear a small argument between Mrs. Dodds and Percy. Peering through the door, the blonde saw Mrs. Dodds transform into some weird bat-like creature. Before she could attack Percy, Naruto decided to make his presence known. The two were alerted as the doors opened, revealing Naruto, and Naruto, what, run? Percy shouted, but the blonde ignored the teen as his attention was on the humanoid bat that was once Miss Dodds, who looked visibly pale for some odd reason. The blonde saw she was about to escape, but he would have none of that. Blue threads shot out formed the blonde's right hand fingertips and wrapped around the monster. Percy, keep this between the two of us. Got it, Naruto said, staring into Percy's sea green eyes with his piercing cerulean blue ones. The teen nodded and, with a single tug of the threads, the bat-like creature was sliced into multiple bits, leaving a pull of blood before it vanished into light particles. Percy felt like vomiting but was able to hold it back. Just then, Nancy walked in. I hope Mrs. Dodds whipped you, but she shut up when she saw Naruto glaring at her. Daxon, I will talk to you later, but for now both you and Boba Fett regroup with the class. Now, he said with a cold and commanding tone. The two teens nodded and promptly ran. You can come out now Mr. Brunner. I can sense your horses behind from a mile away, he said. Said Latin teacher wheeled in. Who are you? He asked. That is what I should be asking you. Why are you covered in an illusion, specifically your lower area, he said, while channeling visible Kai and manifesting his Hanyu mask, with black itcher and large centipedes crawling out of his eyes. Mr. Brunner went white at seeing such a horrific sight, but calmed himself down. How did you know, he asked, albeit still frightened. I'm not originally from this dimension, since my father and grandmother brought me here from my dimension, he said. He must be a demigod then Mr. Brunner thought, since only gods and goddesses could possibly go into different dimension. He decided to tell Naruto his identity and the reason why he was here among other things. So, let me get this straight. You name his Chiron, a centaur, the trainer of heroes and one of the directors, the other being a god of Camp Half-Blood. You are able to hide yourself under the mist, which hides the appearance of any supernatural event from mortals. And the reason you are here is to watch over Percy Jackson, who you suspected to be a demigod child of the Big Three. Naruto summarized. Yes, you summarized it perfectly Mr. Yuzumaki. Sai Moxie, his story checks out. Don't kill him. Chiron turned around and saw the brunette was about to stab him with a kunai. Shame, I really wanted to test this new metal we found Naruto, she said. Taking a closer look, Chiron's eyes widened as he recognized that particular metal. Moxie raised a single brow at the shocked look on the centaur. You recognize this metal? She asked. Chiron nodded. Yes, it's called Imperial Gold. A metal that is fatal to immortals and half-blood mortals. How did you acquire it? He asked since, even during ancient times, the metal was very closely guarded. It was a gift, actually, from when I was brought here to this world, Naruto answered. It was true, after Naruto read his mom and grandmother's letter. He found several scrolls containing several weapons that were in his world's likeness. But since he already had his own weapon, the blonde decided to give them to Moxie. Chiron, we'll watch over Jackson for now, since I owe the kid a bit of an explanation from what happened earlier. I know you saw what I did, and I'll explain further in the future. But for now let us rejoin the class to avoid suspicion. Chiron nodded at Naruto's words and left. By we, you mean you, right, because I'm not about to babysit a kid. Hell the only missions I don't join are escort and guard missions, Moxie said with a tone that left no room for argument. Naruto rolled his eyes at this but otherwise nodded. Fine, but maintain radio connection, in case something happens. Got it. She nodded. I love you my maelstrom. A soft angelic voice whispered into Naruto's ear. She captured his lips in a passionate kiss as she lay on top of him. She pulled back slightly, and I forever will, she continued before recapturing his lips. This woman had long black hair, pale skin that seemed illuminated under the sun's rays. Her bright brown eyes held warmth and love in them for him. Her slender frame, and that smile on her face, which was blocked slightly by sun's rays in her bangs. To Naruto this person on top of him is perfect, and he swore that he'll never let her go, and this angelic beauty's name was. The sound of horn 
Prince woke Naruto up from his pleasant dream, and he cursed whoever that was. Whoever that was is dead, he muttered, sitting upright on his seat. You're awake, did you have a nice nap? Naruto gazed to his left to see his partner driving, and it suddenly came back to him. He looked back to confirm it, and, indeed, in the back of his car was Percy Jackson, who was deep in thought. Earlier, after the school trip ended, Naruto asked Percy to go with him in Moxie, stating that he'll explain what he saw and drive him to his apartment. The drive was interesting, somewhat. Percy couldn't believe that the blonde was from another world, and asked Naruto to prove it, which Naruto did by summoning a shadow clone next to Percy, and forming his signature Jutsu Rasengan. Needless to say, Percy's mind was blown and made him think that that Naruto was some kind of superhero in disguise, like he read in his comic books, which Naruto denied saying heroes doesn't exist in real life, only people doing their jobs that make them out to be. After that, Naruto took a small nap since there was slight traffic, that was an hour ago. I did before that annoying horn woke me up, Naruto said in an annoyed tone, though he covered the emotion he felt, he felt a pang of sadness in his heart as he recalled that evening. It seems like a lifetime ago for the blonde, yet it felt like yesterday when he held her in his arms and he heard those words, those simple words that held so much meaning for him. But it would seem his partner noticed as Moxie squeezed Naruto's hand softly to let the blonde feel that she knows and is comforting him. He smiled slightly and nodded to her thanking her for, once again, being there for him. Taking in some air, Naruto calmed himself down before looking back at Percy. Jackson, this is your stop, I'll see you tomorrow okay, he said. Percy nodded and got out of the car. Thanks for the help Naruto, oh, and just call me Percy, since I'm calling you by your first name, Percy said with a slight smile. Naruto nodded, sure thing, I'll see you tomorrow, oh, and don't ask about anything regarding Mrs. Dodds okay, better that you forget about her. With that, Naruto left, though not before leaving a shadow clone to watch over Percy. You think he'll be alright? Moxie asked, taking a left turn. Hmm, hard to say, with what happened to him today. He's trying to hide it, but he's shaken. All we can do is watch over him for now, and see what happens. Naruto stated calmly looking towards the setting sun. The sky was giving off a menacing color of red-orange, and, to Naruto, it was foreboding. Why do I get the feeling that things are going to change? Whatever that feeling was, one thing is certain in Naruto's mind, he's ready for anything. By the way, why did you admit to Chiron that the medal was a gift, Moxie asked, wondering why her blonde partner Love Interest admitted it. It wouldn't matter if you got the information out of him, based on his reaction. That kind of metal ore is something of a rare commodity that is not easily found, so no making bullets out of imperial gold, the blonde replied, getting a cute pout from Moxie. A shame I couldn't get a new toy. A short drive, later the car stopped at a certain apartment. Do say hello for me, Moxie said, knowing that her secret love interest was visiting someone who he viewed as an eternal figure. Be sure you don't want to join us. I'm sure Abuchan won't mind, Naruto said, though he still didn't know why she would ask him to call her grandmother considering how young and beautiful she looked, but, then again, her glare and that sweet smile of hers, which Naruto learned to use, said otherwise. I'm sure, besides, someone has to manage your clones who, need I remind you, are out on a mission, Moxie said before driving off. Making sure he was proper and clean, Naruto rang the doorbell, instantly. He heard the sound of footsteps getting louder and louder getting closer to the door. The door swung open, revealing a radiant woman with brilliant and gentle green eyes. Good afternoon Rayabu chan Naruto greeted his somewhat grandmother, who smiled brightly enough to put the sun to shame. Ah, Nero-chan, good afternoon, I was beginning to think you had forgotten, she said with her motherly tone that seemed to hold no equal. Naruto scratched the back of his head, a bit embarrassed at being late, sorry, but me and my companion got caught in traffic, he replied to the kind and radiant women in front of him. The blonde blinked for a bit when he saw Ray studying him, as if trying to discover something. Hm, did something happen to you, Nero-chan, she asked, her voice laced with worry. Naruto inwardly sighed and knew he could never lie to her. Not counting times he withheld certain information about himself, since he didn't want to lose this bond they shared. Unbeknownst to the blonde, Ray already knew he wasn't originally from this world. Having talked with both his mother and her daughter, and was fine with him withholding such information, till he deemed it necessary to share those facts with her. She herself has hadn't told him that she is, in fact, his actual grandmother, but after the time they spent together, it became apparent that Naruto already saw her as a maternal figure. Naruto nodded, letting his masks drop for the only person, aside from Moxie, that he trusts. The former blonde shinobi felt a comforting hand on his shoulder. Let's talk inside, and you can tell your Abu-chan all about it. Naruto nodded, unable to refuse her request, like he ever could. The blonde and Kriki sat down on the living room couch, while Ray prepared some tea and snacks. Naruto took note of the decor of the living room. It was a bit reminiscent of the decoration that of Greek houses. How Naruto knew that, while reading and watching some TV, special about it. It was lavishing, to say the least. Simple, yet elegant with that homey feel to it. Naruto felt that feeling of safety and security that only a true home could bring. The smell of cookies caught Naruto's senses, and it smelled heavenly. 
The blonde looked up to see Ray with a batch of cookies and tea. He also took notice of the red dress she wore, which seemed to highlight her curves and her natural beauty. Naruto buried certain thoughts back to the deepest and darkest corner of his mind, and looked down with the red blush on his face. Of course Ray saw this and smirked slightly. I still got it she thought, and mused that she could bring out such a reaction from her grandbaby, who mind you, had grown up with beautiful mortal women, and is currently living with a demigoddess who she is certain is related to a certain goddess she knows. Is something the matter Nero chan The titaniness of motherhood asked innocently, placing the tray down on the wooden table, that looked very expensive, and moving closer to the blonde, making said blonde shift a bit uncomfortably at the close proximity. You seem flustered. Do you have a fever? She said, placing her forehead on his checking his temperature. This only served to deepen Naruto's blush as he stumbled backwards and stuttered incoherent words. Mu, you don't seem to have any sort of fever unless oh my, she said suddenly, gaining Naruto's attention. Both of her hands were on her cheeks, with a mild blush, and looking away from him. It seems Nerichan is having illicit thoughts about this widowed woman. Should I be concerned that my Nerichan would ravish me to satisfy his beastly urges? She said, sending Naruto's brain straight into the gutter, as he tried to recompose himself and keep his mind clean, so much so that he overloaded his brain, causing him to pass out. Hm, I might have gone too far she thought, tilting her head slightly while placing her index finger just below her lips. Sometime later, Naruto awoke and found that his head was currently on Ray's lap, making the former blonde shinobi jump. Are, is something the matter Nero chan she asked innocently. Said blonde shook his head and took a seat. Are you sure that you are alright? You seem jumpy today Nero chan Naruto didn't know if his grandmother figure was doing this on purpose or not, since he couldn't tell with that innocent look of hers, and he's an expert at reading facial expressions, but it seems he couldn't determine whether or not Ray's expression was real or fake. Taking a second to calm down, since his mind was still a bit rattled, the blonde spoke, yes, Ray Abu chan I'm fine, it could be because of the writer the fact that I skipped both breakfast and lunch. Naruto forgot to eat his morning meal, which consists of a good, healthy bowl of cereal or bacon and eggs and other morning meals. He even forgot to buy or bring lunch with him. The blonde inch cricky flinched at the sight of his grandmother figure's stern glare. You should really learn to take better care of yourself, Nero chan she scolded, making him bow his head in embarrassment. I know, I just had a lot of things on my mind, Naruto answered weakly. That's still not an excuse to neglect your health, Rei lectured, still maintaining that glare of hers. I'm sorry, the blonde apologized, feeling like child being scolded by his mother. It was like when Lilith would scold him for doing something reckless when he was a kid. Now Rei was doing the same thing different circumstances, same situation with him neglecting his health in favor of his brooding, I forgive you, now eat up, I would hate for these to go to waste, she gestured to her homemade cookies, which the blonde found very addictive, same with his ramen addiction and a bit of a cereal addiction, so, are you going to tell me, what has caused my Nero chan such emotional distress, she asked before taking a sip of herbal tea, the tit anus saw Naruto flinch ever so slight, and she instantly knew it had something to do with his past, something very painful, it was further backed up by the fact that he scratched his left side where his heart is. And something must have happened to someone close to his heart to stir such emotions from my grandson she thought. If someone were to ask how she knew this, the answer that someone would get is that it's Ray's motherly instincts. Something just made me remember a painful part of my past. It involved someone I loved, he said in a lamentable tone. He felt a familiar painful knot around his heart. It was almost a year since her death, though the exact date was different from his world to this. He still knew when, how could he not? It was, after all, the death of someone he loved and still does. That day has been etched into his very soul. It is something no one could easily forget. Explaining it would be too painful. Even if I recall our time together, any of those memories would only be washed away, as I remember her dying in my arms. As she said those three words before she died, I couldn't say those words back. Sometime while speaking, his tears began to flow down his cheeks. He would not let anyone see him like this, aside from those who he trusted the most. Heck, even back then he didn't shed a single tear, bottling up his sadness, since he didn't trust his former teammates. Naruto felt a pair of arms wrap around his form, and a hand rub his back in a comfort manner. Let it out Naruto, just let it all out. Bottling it up will only make it worse, Ray whispered gently, letting her aura wash over her grandson. Not even a second later, the blonde finally let the dam loose and started to cry, letting out years of pent-up sadness in one go. That's it, don't worry Naruto, I'm here. At the moment, Ray didn't see the strong blonde warrior that her grandson had become, but the emotionally damaged child who had been wrong throughout most of his life. Soon, the tears died down, and Ray heard light snoring coming from her grandson. Oh near chan my poor grandson, those mortals really did a number on you she thought, feeling her anger rising, and as well his resentment towards the mortals who harmed her grandson, which was only equal to her hatred towards a certain titan. She would like to smite Kanoha for their transgressions towards her grandson, but in doing so, 
she would also be harming those he considered family, as well as the few good mortals who showed him kindness. Let's do away with those thoughts for another time. Right now I need to put Nero-chan to bed she thought, and use her power to teleport to the nearest room and lay Naruto down. Hypnos, I do hope my grandson sleeps easily in Morpheus. You better make sure his dreams are wonderful or else, she said, threateningly. Using her omnipresence to send a clear message to the god of sleep and the god of dreams, both heard it and shivered in fear while proceeding to do just that, they didn't want to suffer the Titanus's wrath. Time skip, one week. It has been well over one week since the incident at the museum. For a certain dark-haired teen, it was hectic. Everyone around him acted like Mrs. Dodds didn't exist and was on their merry way, oblivious to everything. The only person he could talk to about this was one blonde shinobi, as Naruto called himself. Naruto understood his reason for being jumpy and helped Percy so he wouldn't lose his mind, or at the least feel out of place, so to speak. The blonde noticed that Grover had been acting strange as well. It was as if something was on the verge of jumping him, or he was expecting something bad to happen at any moment. Seriously, Naruto thought that goat smelling kid was on drugs or was high on medication due to the boy's jitteriness. It wasn't until he asked Chiron about Grover's questionable acting that he got an answer. The trainer of heroes admitted that Grover was Percy's assigned guardian and a satyr, half man half goat, which explains the goat smell. And the reason why Grover was acting so nervous was because of the incident with Mrs. Dodds, and the fear that other creatures may know of Percy. But Naruto was not satisfied and felt Chiron was holding back on him. But the centaur's look pleaded that he not press the issue. So he let the matter drop. For now anyways, Naruto hated not knowing anything about the situations he was in, even during his time with Moxie. Before the two would pick a contract, the blonde would gather as much information as he possibly could, of the people he and Moxie would work for to the mission itself, such as the place, the people, and, in most cases, the opposition they were up against. The blonde would go into every tiny detail and make sure no stone went unturned. After all, knowledge is power and, in the right hands, it could become a tool of salvation or utter destruction. An example of this was in the battlefield. Lack of information is fatal in the field. It is a recipe for disaster and utter failure. You're basically going into unknown territory blind, not knowing how many people are going to kill you. There's that old saying, blind a soldier for a second and he or she is dead, or ignorance can and will get you killed. Percy still felt out of place, more so than usual, making the blonde sigh as he looked over some paperwork. Percy, stop jittering like a bug and just relax. The blonde sat in a calming tone before stamping down on one of the files. Currently, Percy was in Naruto's office, or rather, the student council office and the disciplinary committee, since he just couldn't stand the atmosphere of the people around him, aside from his friend Grover and Chiron, or, as he still knows him, Mr. Brunner. I know you feel out of place at the moment, but try your best to ignore it. Besides, Mrs. Dodds, from what I gather, wasn't your favorite teacher, so this shouldn't be affecting you this much. He said not taking his eyes off his paperwork. It would be much easier to use his shadow clones, but he didn't want to be too dependent on them. It's just frustrating and weird to see everyone act so so casual, like that old could never existed in the first place, Percy said, frustrated. He was about to curse, but remembered that the blonde hated people cursing in his presence. Anyone caught talking in such a vulgar manner would be strictly punished for it. It's as if she was just a figment of my imagination or something, and I feel so aw, I can't even explain it. Percy sighed in frustration and slumped down in the leather couch he was sitting in. He truly did feel out of place for the past week and couldn't concentrate on anything, which was bad, since they have a test tomorrow, and, with his grades, let's just say he was sure he wasn't going to come back to this school next year. The blonde sighed softly, finally finished with the last stack of paperwork. Whoever invented this, may they suffer in the afterlife. The blonde cursed whoever made the term paperwork, and introduced it to the world. Truly the being is of pure pure evil. Now turning his attention to the stress teen, maybe that semester his clone took in psychology at Harvard University, could come in handy. Nah, in this kind of situation he doubted it. There are just some things that can't be explained or even reasoned out. Percy, it's better if you push those thoughts away in favor of tomorrow's upcoming test. If you need assistance, then I will help you, he reasoned, trying to get the sea green eyed teen's mind off the former math teacher, and onto something more important, and, probably, stressful. Meh, it's the lesser of two evils. At least with this, he won't act like someone who's about to go insane or something close to it, he'll probably blow a gasket. Yeah, that's it the blonde thought. For some reason, he imagined Percy doing just that, but in an anime-like or possibly cartoonish way. Percy nodded, almost as soon as Naruto finished his last sentence. Why? Well, Naruto is considered the number one student in school, despite their similar condition. When he had asked the blonde how he managed that, he just answered, I just learned how to read backwards. He said it as if it was the simplest thing in the world. It is true though, Naruto found a way around his condition. It started when he was a kid. He found out that when he was trying to read, the words would somehow turn backwards, as if some omnipotent and possibly omnipresent entity was messing with him. Later in Naruto's life, he called it Murphy, after he heard about Murphy's law. Okay, let's head to your apartment. But what about your, um, girlfriend? Would she be fine with it? 
Oh, don't worry about Moxie, she's working on something that requires her full attention. Percy nodded and thanked his blonde friend, at least he thinks they're friends. Well we have been hanging out for the past week, but maybe I should ask him he thought. Hey, um, Naruto, Percy called out. Yeah, what it is, Naruto responded while filing the finished paperwork. Are we friends? Percy saw the blonde stop and with a thoughtful look on his face before nodding. We are, by the way, what is taking Grover so long, he wondered out loud. Well, I did tell him not to eat the bean burrito, Percy said while scratching the back of his head followed up by a sigh. And they had chili in them too, he added, seriously, what kind of burrito did the food truck come up with? Oh get him, I have something to finish here first, he said to Percy. Naruto sat down and opened the top part of his desk. Inside were mission reports that his clones had successfully finished and need to be filed accordingly. Hey, just because he's in school doesn't mean he neglects his mission contracts that his and Moxie's permanent clients handed to them. That being government agencies and other organizations that cannot be named. Ah, the wonders of shadow clones. An overpowered technique in the hands of Naruto, and probably any other Jinchkriki or Yuzumaki. Since his clan was the one who made this forbidden technique, it was forbidden because of the required amount of chakra. The jutsu would take away a lot of chakra just to make one and only people with at least cage level chakra reserves and control could make, at best, four. The jutsu would kill if used by a novice with low chakra. But for someone like him, an Uzumaki and a Jinchkriki, it wasn't a bother. Well maybe the slight intake of sudden information that gave him a headache, but that was just mildly annoying. Okay, let's review today's mission report. The blonde began to speed read through the reports, analyzing each detail, checking it for things that could have been done, so the mission could have ended quicker and more efficiently than it already had, and if there were any faults in each of them. His mind, once again, drifted back to his maternal figure, who he visited after classes, except if there were exams or a very important mission involved. And during his free time, Naruto still recalled waking up in her guest room, followed by sharing a wonderful breakfast with her and so forth. Basically, he spent the entire day with her, helping her with the house, assisting her in buying the groceries and just simply chatting with her. The blonde truly enjoyed his time with her, and was angry with himself for still keeping secrets from her. But his fear of losing her, always held him back from telling her. I really hate having to keep secrets from Rei Abu-chan, he thought while leaning back in his chair. The blonde doesn't keep secrets from those he considers precious to him, which consisted of Lilith, his motherly figure back in the elemental nations, the girls who work in the brothel, his older sister figures, everyone in the red light district, who saw him not as an abomination that needed to be killed but simply as him, as Naruto, Anko, who knew the same pain of loneliness and hatred as him. Another person he loved was his Tenchi Haim, who knew the same burden as him and Anko, also the one he loves. Rei, his grandmother motherly figure and Moxie, his partner and really, really close friend, who he also has strong feelings for. Naruto, is still oblivious to her feelings, but is not without reason. There are also his two sentient partners in Kayubi, who he also came to care and develop feelings for but, like Moxie, he didn't know if she holds the same feelings as he does. Again dense as adamantium. Speaking of the brunette and the red-orange haired vixen, the day after Naruto left Rei's home and returned to his apartment, Moxie suddenly jumped him and dragged him to the bedroom. Five hours later, a content and satisfied Moxie was sleeping soundly on Naruto, using his chisel chest as a pillow. The same could not be said about the blonde. The moment he fell asleep, Kayubi pulled him into his mindscape, and they proceeded to rot like rabbits in heat till morning, when he felt his consciousness returning. Any other man would have killed to be in Naruto's position. For the blonde, he was just happy that he could make them happy. It was what his adopted mother taught him after all. Never leave a girl unhappy and unsatisfied. It was a gentleman's job after all. At least, that's what Lilith and his older sister figures told him. Among those teachings were, always treat the female gender with respect, view them as equals, and treat them with kindness, with the exception of fangirls, unsavory women, who his sisters described as total bitches, and those who make any woman look weak or pathetic. He cared for each and every one of them. He would gladly give his life if it meant protecting them. This could be his biggest flaw, as well as his most endearing quality. But, it is who he is, and it is what drives him to become strong enough to protect those he cares for and loves. Please hold on, I'll save you, Naruto choked out, trying to fight the tears as he was trying to heal the person he loved, trying to heal the large gash on her left side just above her heart. He promised himself that he wouldn't lose her and is currently failing, P please, hold on, Naruto croaked out, his emotion clear as day fear, dismay, and denial. The blonde felt her almost cold hands caressing his cheeks, as she would do since their first date, her eyes locked with his, and she mustered all her remaining strength into saying one last thing to him. Non error to I love you, her hand fell making the blonde's eyes widen in shock, as he heard her last words before he felt her heart stop. No, no, no. He cried out in anguish, denying the sight before him, his Tenshi Haim, dead in his arms. Naruto jerked up harshly, panting heavily, tears flowing down his face as he recalled the day he lost a piece of himself and the person he loved. But he couldn't mope around, since he felt two familiar presences. He quickly took out some eye drops, and some paperwork just before Percy and Grover came in. Naruto, I got Grover here so we could wait, are you crying? That earned Percy a slap on the head by Grover, 
who pointed to the eye drops in the stack of papers. No, Percy, I wasn't crying, my eyes just felt dry, so I had to use some eye drops. I'm sorry if my voice sounds off, my throat feels dry too, the blonde lied smoothly. So Grover, will you be joining us in a late night cram? Naruto continued while putting away the eye drops and papers. The teen shook his head. I would, but Mr. Brenner asked me to help him with something. Don't worry, I've studied beforehand, the Sada replied. He could tell that Naruto was studying him with those piercing cerulean blue eyes. It was as if he was trying to determine something before nodded. Then we'll see you tomorrow Grover. Oh and just call me Naruto. Got it. The Caucasian teen nodded. Scene change Percy's dormitory in time skip evening. So, did you get all of that Percy? Naruto asked as he was currently tutoring the teen, who looked like he just went three rounds of boxing and lost. He nodded in response. Okay then, I'll ask you a question. The blonde started. Tell me the difference between Chiron and Sharon. Amo, one has an I, and the other has an A in their name. And... Ah Chiron, that's with an I, has a horse behind and is known as the trainer of heroes. Chiron, the one with the A, is the fairy man of the dead and really greedy, due to his obsession with Olympian money. Naruto smiled and nodded. Good, now, why can't you be this attentive in class? And why did you have me read to you? Percy sheepishly scratched the back of his head and chuckled slightly. Well, dyslexia gets in the way, and you don't seem to have a problem with that so. The dark-haired teen trailed off from here. The ginch cricky sighed. Percy, you still need to learn this stuff on your own. I know it may be tough for people like us, but we have to make do. He lectured the teen, who nodded and began to read on his own. A few minutes later and the blonde saw Percy was getting more and more agitated before he finally snapped and threw his book, absently cursing. Fun. Halting in his agitated state, he forgot the person who was with him. I'll let that word slide since you were agitated, but try to use less unsavory words Percy. Percy nodded quickly under Naruto's heated glare. Maybe I should go see Mr. Brunner. He might have a way that is good for me. No offense to you method Naruto, but I wouldn't be able to just magically learn how to read backwards. Naruto nodded, understanding the teen's reason and deciding to join him, since he had some questions for the trainer of heroes, like, why the weather was getting worse and more and more rampant earthquakes. Yeah, those kinds of questions. Both teens made their way downstairs to the faculty office, which was dark and empty aside from Mr. Brunner's office. There were only a few steps from the door handle, when they heard voices inside the Latin's teacher office. Worried about Percy and Naruto, sir, Grover's voice rang out. Naruto raised an eyebrow that his name being mentioned, but shrugged it off thinking that either Grover must have sensed he's a demigod, or Chiron told the Caucasian teen that he is, alone this summer, I mean, a kindly one in this school. Now that we know for sure, and take no too, we would only make matters worse if we rushed the boy, and no, I am not worried about Naruto, I did tell you what happened to Mrs. Dodds, correct, Mr. Brunner said, cutting Grover off. Why yeah, Grover's voice sounded shaken, probably because of the details on how Naruto killed the furry, but sir, the summer solstice deadline. Grover was cut off again by Chiron, will have to be resolved without Percy. Grover, let him enjoy his time while he still can, he said gently, though it sounded like Percy was going to die or something. And Naruto, what about him? Grover asked. Mr. Yuzumaki is a different case. I'm sure you have sensed the power he's holding back and expertly hiding, correct? Yes, I still can't believe a demigod has that much power and could keep it in check, and, more importantly, hidden. But we're getting off topic sir, I, I can't fail my duties again. Grover's voice was very familiar to a certain blonde, and said blonde wondered what Grover could have meant by that. You haven't failed Grover, Mr. Brunner said kindly. I should have seen her for what she was. Now, let's just worry about keeping Percy alive until next. Percy accidentally dropped his textbook making an audible thud. He was paying such close attention to the conversation, that he did not realize the book was beginning to slip from his grasp. Naruto acted quickly and grabbed Percy's arms and the textbook before Shunshin, body flicker, back to Percy's dorm, said T nearly hurled as he felt very dizzy. Sorry about that Percy, don't worry, the dizziness should subside after a few seconds Naruto said, getting the teen a glass of water. We'll talk with Grover tomorrow, since it'll be easier because he's a bad liar. For now, try to get some sleep since we have an exam tomorrow. Naruto said before vanishing in a swirl of black and white feathers. To Percy, that exit was the coolest thing he'd ever seen. The next afternoon, they finally got out of their three-hour Latin exam. Naruto got out much earlier, thanks to his photographic memory, which was both a blessing and curse, and waited for his dark-haired friend, who was currently talking with Chiron. Well, that doesn't look good Naruto thought sensing Percy's emotions, mostly frustration and anger. Percy rushed out of the classroom and made his way towards his dorm. Let me guess, you tried to pep talk and it didn't end well, Naruto said. Chiron nodded and explained what happened. Don't blame yourself Chiron, you were distracted and stressed, I can see it clearly in your eyes. It happens to us from time to time, so don't beat yourself up, okay, Naruto said kindly. Kindly, trying to lift the man's spirit. Thank you for your words Naruto, but it still doesn't excuse the fact that I made Percy feel worse. The trainer of the heroes felt like kicking himself for his poor choice of words to the dark haired teen, and it was only made worse, since it was in front of the class. With another sigh, he said, I'll be leaving for the camp. I assume that both you and Moxie are joining.
morning, he received a nod from the blonde before he left, presumably to catch up with Percy. The blonde sighed. When he finally caught up with Percy, he was already packing his things. The whisker teen could see the negative emotions rolling off the sea green eyed teen and place a comforting hand on his shoulder to calm him down. Hey Percy, don't worry, there are other schools out there. Not just this one. Who knows, they may have something for our condition. He told Percy gently. Percy blinked. What do you mean now? Are you not staying here for another semester? He asked. Dude, we're friends right? Getting a nod, Naruto continued, what you should know is that I never leave a friend alone, besides, this place is too stuck up with rich brats and boring classes, now come on, Moxie's waiting for me, and I don't want to keep a lady waiting, it's rude, like most kids in this school, that got a chuckle from the dark haired boy, as he followed his blonde friend, both teens spotted Moxie and Grover, who looked very jumpy, waiting for them at the bus terminal, hey Percy, she greeted before walking up beside Naruto and locking his left arm around her, pushing it between her bosom, and leaning her head onto his shoulder. How was the exam Grover? Naruto asked. That fine, he stuttered out as the four of them got on the bus. During the whole ride, Grover kept glancing down the aisle nervously, watching the other passengers and looking out the window, as if he was expecting to be jumped by something or someone. I guess it's as perfect a time as any Naruto sent Percy a nod. The teen knew what it meant. Why so spook Grover? Naruto asked innocently, getting said teen's attention. The disguised satyr was waving his hands frantically in dismissal. The yeah, Grover, not getting it lately, Moxie continued. Giggling and getting a blush from Grover, he didn't know how to answer her. Yeah, you've been looking around. What? Looking for kindly ones, Percy said. Going in for the kill, so to speak. The Caucasian teen's eyes widened, and he nearly jumped out of his seat, and looked like he was having a heart attack. Well, what do you mean? He asked, lying and trying to play innocent, which he failed at. Underwood, you might as well tell us the truth. Both Percy and I overheard you and Mr. Brunner talking last night, Naruto said in a dead serious tone. Those who heard it shivered in fear and shook their heads in pity for the boy. It was only made worse for Grover since since Naruto was blasting him with his kai. The satyr began to think that the blonde was enjoying this or something. Oh, and Grover, know that I do not like imposing my will and intimidating others, especially my friends, but if need be, I will, he said, seemingly reading Grover's mind. Grover sighed and took out a card from his pocket and handed it over to them. So this is your summer camp or something? Moxie asked. Though she already knew what Camp Half-Blood is, she acted ignorant for a certain dark-haired teen. The satyr nodded. Yeah, well, that's just so you guys can contact me if you need my help, he said. Why? Percy asked curiously, what exactly are you not telling us? However, before Grover could answer, the bus suddenly stopped and black smoke began to pour out from the dashboard, filling the bus with the disgusting smell of rotten food. Another reason to add on to why I don't like using public transportation, the blonde muttered as they got off the bus in the middle of nowhere. Taking a look around, Naruto, at the least, took a bit of comfort in seeing nature and the quiet countryside. Why is there a fruit stand here? Percy pointed over to the other side of the road where, indeed, an old fruit stand that had various fruits, giving it a colorful image of the tropics, was standing. Next to the fruit stand were three ancient-looking ladies sitting on racking chairs, swaying back and forth. They were sewing one humongous sock, weird the blonde thought before glancing towards his companions. Percy and Moxie had that curious look on their faces while Grover, well, Grover looked like he just took a huge dump in his pants and looked sickly pale. What got into him? Glancing back towards the three old ladies, he noticed that they were looking at Percy for some odd reason. Tell me they're not looking at Percy. They are, aren't they? Grover's voice was laced with terror and worry. Yeah, weird right? But do you think those socks would fit anyone and who is it for? Percy said asked. His tone sounded both disbelieving and curious. This got a shrug from Naruto's partner. I don't know, maybe for Bigfoot or someone with abnormally large feet. Either that or they just have a lot of free time in their old lives. Moxie replied. Still keeping her eyes on the three very, very old women. This isn't the time for jokes. Come and let's get back on the Naruto. What are you doing? Grover shouted at the blonde, who was making his way towards the three old ladies. Excuse me, Naruto called out, trying to get their attention. Yes dear, all three of them said in perfect unison. Naruto took out a black jacket from his bag. Could you please sew this for me? I will pay you, he asked kindly and loud enough for a certain satyr to hear. Getting a disbelieving look from and making him shout out again. Naruto what are you do? But he was cut off by Naruto's glare. Grover, you are making a scene, he said. Pointing to the people who were looking at the Caucasian teen. And, if you must know, I am asking them if they could sew the hole in my jacket. To which I will pay them, he said. Turning his attention back to the three old ladies. Sorry about my friend, he's a bit jumped today. By the way, my name is Naruto Yuzumaki. Naruto apologized and bowed his head. It's fine dear, the youth these days are different from our time. Oh and my name is Atropos. The old lady holding a pair of scissors 
said. And to answer your question dear, yes we would gladly fix that nasty hole on your jacket. And please call me Lachesis, the old lady holding two metal rods said. You don't need to pay us, but maybe you could buy some of our fruits. We work tirelessly for those. And please call me Clotho, the old lady with the big bowl of urine said. Naruto nodded happily and handed his jacket to the three old ladies. While they were busy fixing his jacket, the blonde took some time to buy some fruits, such as grapes, strawberries, green and red apples, and peaches, which surprised Naruto, since that kind of fruit is not normally found in this area of America. Once he got what he needed from the fruit stand, Naruto paid for everything, thank you dear, and here is your jacket. Atropos handed his jacket back, Naruto bowed his head in thanks, and made his way back to his group. Such a good boy he turned out to be, Clotho said while pulling out a single thread from the bowl of yarn. Yes, considering how he was treated by his people, though they will meet their ends very soon, Lachesis added with a bit of venom in her voice, as she grasped the thread with her rod. Once the blonde was with his friends, he saw that Grover was about to faint, he looked back to see Atropos was about to cut a thread, making him wonder why Grover was so interested in it. That's it we are getting out of here, the Caucasian teen said, grabbing both Percy and Moxie's arms. Hey, watch it, they both said, with Moxie removing Grover's grip from her arm. Only Naruto can touch me, she hissed, making both teens blush at the double meaning in her words, as she swung her arms around Naruto's left arm. An audible snip could be heard. They looked to see the thread of yarn that Lachesis had in her hand was now cut by Tropo's scissors. No, 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 Grover kept repeating like a mantra before he scuffled to the front of the bus. He kicked it as hard as he could, making a dent in it. Surprisingly enough, the bus shuddered back to life with the engine roaring. The passengers cheered, since they finally get to leave, and the driver patted Grover on the back. Good thinking kid, now everyone, back on board, he said. Naruto was about to get on board when he suddenly stopped, alerting his three companions. He suddenly moved away from the bus and started hailing a taxi. Naruto, what's wrong? Percy asked, feeling quite nervous. He blamed it on his Caucasian friend, for acting like they were about to be jumped by something. Percy is there anyone important to you here? Naruto asked without even looking at the teen. My mom, why? Naruto's tone of voice suddenly filled the sea green eyed teen with dread, the same kind he fell before Mrs. Dodds transformed into a monster and was about to kill him. Before Naruto answered the teen, a taxi finally stopped, I'll tell you on the way, now get in. The blonde ordered. Once inside, Naruto placed the driver under Jinjutsu that would make him think that they were having a pleasant chat about summer plans or about school. The clone that I left in school suddenly vanished. Naruto stopped himself after seeing the confused look on both Percy and Grover making him sigh. Good thing the taxi was a hybrid, or what Naruto was going to do next would be awkward. He made a cross sign. Suddenly, a poo sound was heard from the back, and both teens' eyes widened when they saw another Naruto. This is one of my abilities, and the reason why I can't finish any and all of my paperwork so fast. I can make a clone of myself, and when they dispel, anything they learn passes back to me. From the memory of my clone, our skull was burned down. The last part made both Percy and Grover nearly faint. The latter was very close. Grover, no more lies. The creature that burned our skull down and killed all more who were still there was a large lizard-like creature with black scales. Grover's skin went pale, and he had to place a hand over his chest to try and calm himself down from having a heart attack. A dragon, Percy muttered in disbelief. Naruto nodded. Percy, since that creature came to our school, I'm assuming it is either looking for you or all of us, so we need to leave. We can only take those you consider precious with us. My mom. Alright, when we get there, act casual. We don't want to give your mother a heart attack, like the one what Grover almost experienced. Moxie, check on him please. Moxie slapped the Caucasian teen, snapping him from his fear-induced trance. He's fine, she said casually, though inside she was in panicking and fear. It wasn't until she looked at Naruto's calm and worryless face that her own nerves and fear subsided. If anything, she was berating herself for forget just who she was with. She knew Naruto had already formulated a plan to get them somewhere safe and possibly deal with the dragon, if it comes to that. Good, Grover focus, Naruto said while snapping his fingers, getting his friend's attention. Does Percy's mom know about you? Grover took a breath and nodded. Good, then this will make things less complicated. Wait, what do you mean by that? The blonde turned to the black-haired teen. It means that she knew certain things, things she kept secret to protect you, I assume. This makes it easier to explain to her why we need to leave and go someplace safe. The cab stopped in front of Naruto and Moxie's apartment. Once inside, Naruto conjured up several clones and ordered them to pack cloths, supplies, weapons, passports, money, etc. Once everything was in place, they quickly went to the garage and got in Naruto's car. Percy, point me to your address. The dark-haired teen nodded and told Naruto the location of his house. Scene change Jackson residence. Sally Jackson, mother to one Percy Jackson, was a beautiful woman with blue eyes that sparkled and changed color in the light. She had long brown hair with a few streaks of gray in it. She was a wonderful person with a kind, understanding, and passionate personality. She was also currently on the floor holding her reddening cheeks, courtesy of her foul-mouthed and abusive husband, Gabe Ugliano, hitting her like he always does when he is in a bad mood, drunk, or just felt like it. Normally, she would have reported such abuse, but knew it wouldn't end well for two reasons. One was because she couldn't back up her claims, since Gabe's 
poker buddies would back him up. One of them was even a police officer. The other reason, if she does succeed then monsters would pick up on her son's scent. This was the reason she married Gabe, to protect her son, since Gabe had a smell so horrible that it could mask any demigod goddess scent from any monster. The reason was because Gabe smacked her like some whore, which she thought she was. There was an announcement about the school being bombed by a deranged lunatic, with a picture of the smoldering remains of Yancey Academy. A feeling of dread filled Sally as she hoped that her son was not on the list of victims who died in the explosion. Before the news reporter even mentioned a single name, Gabe changed the channel, not really caring about some brats. Sally quickly grabbed the remote and changed the channel back, and to her relief her son was among the students and staff who were safe since they left the school. This action, of course, pissed Gabe off, and he probably smacked her in the face. You bitch. He snapped. In his fit of rage, Gabe grabbed Sally's shirt and quickly ripped it. You need to learn your place you feeding whore, the guys and I will make sure of that. He was about to remove her pants, but was cut off by something piercing his chest and heart. Gabe's poker buddies lit up only to drop dead the second they did. The last thing they saw was a blonde haired teen with a silence 5-7. Mom. Percy quickly rushed towards his mother's side, and Naruto pulled out his jacket, placing it around her to hide her modesty. P. Percy. Finally out of her shocked state, tears welled up in her eyes. Percy brought his mother into a comforting hug, trying his best to comfort her. Behind them, Naruto signaled to give the mother and son some privacy. He summoned three shadow clones and ordered them to dispose of the bodies, either dumping them in some undisclosed area or burning them, while he took care of the security footage. To his luck, all the security cameras were under maintenance, and the building had an incinerator making it easy to dispose the bodies. Naruto then took out his phone, and called several people who owed him a lot of favors. He decided to use one of them. Yeah, it's me yes. I'm calling for a favor you owe me it's quite simple really. I need you to remove 4 people from the system it is. Just tell them it is me who is making the request why you ask. Well, I tell 4 people who were about to rape this poor innocent woman the I remind you of the favor you owe me good yes, goodbye. Naruto received the memories of his clones throwing the body into the incinerator. Before returning his attention to the mother and son, the former finally calming down after a minute of crying. The former blonde shinobi then asked, Miss Jackson, first, allow me to introduce myself and my companion. I am Naruto Uzumaki, but call me Naruto. He then gestured to his partner. My name's Madeline Mox, but please call me Moxie, she said. Thank you for saving me Naruto and please, just call me Sally as well. No need to thank me Sally, I was only doing what was right by by helping my friend's mom. Thanks for that Naruto, Percy said, sending his blonde friend a grateful look. Again, no need. Now Sally, I assume you know Grover, or more specifically what he is. Percy's mom nodded, confusing her son in the processes. Mom, Percy called. Percy, the time for questions is not now. Right now, we need to leave. You can ask her once we are in a safe and secure place, Naruto said sternly. He knew the teen had many things on his mind, but right now, safety is their number one priority. If his assumption as to why Sally even thought about staying with that filth he just killed was correct, then they have a small window of opportunity to get to safety. Is there any place we could hold down for a while Sally, at least until I can make some arrangements? Yes, Naruto, Montauk, we have a cabin there, Percy and I would occasionally stay there on vacation. Now, Naruto knew they needed to get as far away from New York as they could, but the location was close to the camp Chire and told him, good, grab your things and let's go. A minute later, Percy and Sally finished packing and the group left in a hurry.